What? I need salt. You know, white folks don't be seasoning their food. Drop it. Duncan and both come correct. Are you are you saying that your home already is covered in semen? I will not acknowledge or dignify that with an answer, bro. You should already know. If you don't know me by now, <laughs> you will never, never, never spunk me. Oh, what? 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 So yeah, Lovecraft Country. Hey, you know what this is? It's mm-hmm. it's a show, Duncan. Let's get started. Let's do it. I've uh, the recording has begun. That's good, and we missed all that semen chat, which is good. <laughs> Not all of it. There's a little <laughs> semen chat that, <laughs> like like every good thing, Duncan, it's going to start with semen. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Go downhill from there. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then, uh, like all things that begin with semen, it immediately begins to die. I was, I was gonna <laughs> from fap to the coffin. <laughs> That's, that that should be the NIH's motto. From fap to the coffin, we we cover you. Yeah, you're. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, this is this is ridiculous already. Uh huh. Long at all. Yeah, well, you know, like the the show we're talking about uh, is is fairly serious. Yes, very serious, serious, bo. And holy shit, Duncan. Mm-hmm. So here's what happened: is <laughs> if you listen to the show, I know you don't, but if you listen to the show, <laughs> what what you would know is that the last episode we uh, we talk we were going to talk about the first two episodes mm-hmm. and and couldn't. Yes. Uh, because we talked so much about the first episode, we ran out of time. <laughs> we talked so much about what we'd been... In fairness, it was the first recording in a while, so those mm-hmm. intros will run long. Yes. But then we did spend about an hour and a bit chatting about a show, which was an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and and so we ran out of time for uh, the, the second episode, so we're going to do episodes two and three yes, you're uh, today, and... <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, so uh, it it has been a, a a more serious kind of number, but oh my goodness, Duncan, some some powerhouse moments. And this show has given me some of my favorite horror sequences, just flat out horror sequences I've seen on TV in a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just pure. There is a scene in episode three where someone put a goddamn baby head on top of a fully grown basketball player. And then had them walk like Frankenstein, and it might be my favorite visual ever because the baby head is still talking baby, right? You but is mean? clearly happy about murder. Oh yeah, yeah, which murder in its mind. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Shake that small white man like a rattle. Uh, <laughs> kind of amazing. Yeah. Oh man, it's yeah. We're we're having a good time, that's for sure. But but Duncan, yes. Before we we get into the episodes. Uh, mm-hmm. We we like to uh, do a thing here where we talk about something we've seen, both good and bad, yes. uh, here recently. And I got to be honest, I didn't watch a lot of movies uh, over the the course of the past week. Um, uh, but I not that I ain't got nothing to say. In fact, uh, I kind of want to come strong here. Ooh, do it then, and say uh, for my <sighs> is it my bad. It's it's a movie I want to talk to you about, but I think it's my bad. You think it's your bad? I think it's my bad. <laughs> right, go for it then. Okay, well, let's 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 air this weird sort of indifference to the to, to the movie to the point that you can't really quite decide whether or not it's a bad movie. Yeah. All right. So it's random acts of violence. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a bad movie. I just don't think it's a great movie. Okay, but here, like, I I listened to your review of it, and yep. I was like, God damn it, Duncan, answer the question. Um, <laughs> I don't think you've agreed. Which I, is neither neither good nor bad. <laughs> right, exactly. But it, so here's the thing that I wanted to talk to you about mm-hmm. is I think the movie raises an interesting question about whether. Someone who makes a living celebrating an actual crime, mm-hmm. you know, like in, in the society we live in, I think that's a very relevant question. Uh, uh, you know, are they complicit somehow 
in encouraging that kind of violence by celebrating that violence. Yeah, well, specifically when their when their theory of the criminal himself is that there is an artistry in the act of violence in which he perpetrates. Right, but portrayed as the hero in the comic book in random yeah. acts of violence, and yeah, uh, which you know, for listeners, if you don't know what this movie is, it popped up on uh, Shutter. Uh, Which is our favourite talking point at the moment because they're putting out so much fucking shit. In fact, my good movie is from Shudder as well. So strap yourselves in, lot of Shudder chat. Right. Like, I mean, Shudder is, it has turned out to be a great value for mm-hmm. horror fans. And and I don't think Random Acts of Violence is a terrible movie. I don't think it doesn't belong on the channel or anything like that. Um, but I, I wrestle with it because, like I said, you know, the point of the movie is uh, that this uh, comic artist has been drawing. Uh, what is the name of the comic book? It's like Death Killer or uh, yeah, Murder it's, yeah, it's Guy. A, it's a <laughs> Murder Guy. <laughs> murder Guy, a thirteen-part series graphic novel coming your way September. Um, yeah, but it, but he right, looks like a nice guy. He's not a nice guy. He's a murder guy. <laughs> But but that's what it is. It's a the story of a, a serial killer who goes around murdering people and, and creating these very elaborate crime scenes yes. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so he's writing the last issue, the the comic is ending, um, and the, he's doing a tour across Canada essentially. Yes. Uh he's to- struggling with inspiration for the last episode, so he thinks by driving through and visiting some of the stops along the killer's route or traveling back to his hunting grounds will in some way spark a bit of inspiration. But what he doesn't realize is his action in doing that bow may have brought a killer that was never caught out of hibernation. Right. And, and so to me, that is the, the interesting part of the story. Yeah. And I, what the movie doesn't really do though, is do anything with it. Yes. It's a great concept. And I, I think it's an interesting message, but it's almost as if the director gets cold feet to explore it. And I mean, the, the director is the actor in this movie. Um, it, he usually plays comedic roles as well. Mm. So this is him taking a swing at horror. And there was a whole lot to celebrate in this movie. I mean, I think visually, it was a, a, actually a really well shot movie for like a relatively low budget movie. Um, I think acting was all right across the board i don't think it was exceptional um i think the visual aesthetic kind of the cross between the kind of graphic comic animation into the movie was cool actually i I don't think they overplayed that which i thought was brilliant but the movie gets about 45 minutes into maintaining my interest and then it just kind of sputters out towards the end um the last like 45 minutes or 40 minutes to me didn't really do anything at all. It, it just kind of meandered in a series of brutal scenes which never really got like the the kind of first big opening scene of violence, the the kind of the almost the zodiac killing in the car, which I mean I have not seen a killing on screen as vicious as that in a while because the camera lingers over it and this like murderer like stabs like the the driver about 30 times and the camera which would usually pan away does not pan away it just stays there and i was kind of shocked by it but what i found almost in distinct irony <laughs> of the title is that the you know the kind of what should be an exciting topic to cover uh, in a horror movie is random acts of violence you know th- those that can't be pinned back to one killer um or something without justification or meaning became wholly boring. <laughs> like, like halfway through it, I just, I, I just felt like um, interesting set pieces with nothing really to say. Um, you know, like the, it started by answering or proposing a question, which I thought, you know, that could be quite interesting to explore. And then, like, well, we're not going to do that. Next scene, um, and yeah, I, I found it. No, it's not a bad movie, and I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that will enjoy the violence of the movie because it doesn't shy away from it. But to me, there was a really interesting subject in there, just waiting to be teased out and and, and kind of almost reflecting, kind of like the the funny game scenario where you reflect it back on the audience. Um, yeah, you know, like, and, and it's not there. It's not there at all. I'm one of these morbid guys that loves serial killer documentaries would probably buy serial killer memorabilia if I had enough money to do it. Um, But, and I I know that that doesn't make me a terrible person, but it doesn't mean I should be questioning why I would do that. 
um, why I'd be so fascinated to the point of investing money in something like that. And there's a really interesting topic you could get into with that. Um, you know, what what is your role as pertains to that? Um, is there a role in that, or is that just is that just um, on some level like a, a, a kind of negative aspect of capitalism as well? Uh, if you find your niche and it's off tragedy, you know, what does it say about you if you exploit that for money? Um, there's tons of things you could go into, and the movie out with the conversation, which I thought was kind of great in the radio station. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't really. <laughs> really do much after that yeah that to me that was the big disappointment was like well then you just become a movie that is you know sort of refreshingly brutal in its Mm -hmm. in its uh sadistic murder scenes Mm -hmm. where it's like okay well this feels visceral and i have a an emotional reaction to watching this um but other than that it doesn't really it just doesn't fulfill the promise of of, yeah. of what that first like uh, up to the radio station scene like i i'm with you that that scene was like oh shit this this is really going to go into an interesting very you know uh self-reflexive kind of direct direction but mm-hmm. it's a question i think that all people who watch horror movies have asked at one time or another of like you know why am i so fascinated with with this kind of morbid shit what does yeah. that say something about me and also what is the difference between something made up and something that draws so clearly from reality. And it is yep. that the, like you're fictionalizing a real thing. And at what, where is the line between fiction and reality? Yeah. One and, of my favorite characters and all, well, we've spoken about this before in history of cinema is Buffalo Bill and Buffalo Bill, out, you know, is a, is an amalgamation of Ted Bundy and Ed Gein. Mm-hmm. Like, the way he traps his victims is Ted Bundy. What he does to his victims is, you know, Ed Gein. Um, and so that's a bit like um, Thomas Harris pulled that directly out of real-life events and, you know, tweets, you know, moved it slightly to the side to, to create a fictional serial killer uh, character wholly grounded in reality. And, you know... I fucking love that movie. And what does that, you know, there's, there's so many elements that you can get into with it. And maybe it's too much to ask for a movie to, that a movie like this to deliver it. But you, you tease us by setting, you start off so strong in that movie right. that I, I, I'm like, you know, I had my full attention. Um, and then towards the end, it finished and it was at an ending that I kind of expected. Um, and the last 45 minutes kind of dragged on. Not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, with, with just a little bit, just a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of time and a bit a bit more daring, I think. I think sometimes people feel that the daring thing you can do is be very violent on camera, and I actually think that's the least daring thing you can do. It's very easy to be violent on camera, right? It's very, very, especially when you're you're playing to the the festival circuit and shutters picking you up. It's very, very easy to be violent, right? What's maybe a bit more challenging, a bit more difficult, is to take that violence and make it a question, um, which the audience then has to ask about themselves. And like I say, that's what Funny Games does so so well. And it's interesting that, like, maybe that's a concern is, like, Funny Games is still one of those movies that there are swaths of people that just don't get it. Yeah. Just just don't like it, but don't get the message. They just think it's violence for violence sake. Um, and they don't understand the message behind it. And sometimes that can be a bit daunting on a filmmaker. I, I'll tell you, it, it, was an, it had an interesting premise and it was shot very well to the point that I'll be interested to see what it does again. Um, he, he certainly he can certainly direct. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just think he needs some tweaking, so to speak. Um, right. I uh, wish someone had 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 kind of pushed like Jay Baruchel somewhere mm-hmm. in the writing of it to be like, no, nah, man, just like lay it down. Like, be if you're going to be a movie that's going to discuss these themes, then make your movie about those themes and not. Yeah. Just sort of at the end of the movie, it's just sort of this kind of like revenge story, but also maybe a grudging acknowledgement of like, yes, I deserve to die because of my complicitness with Mm -hmm. these new murders. But there's no moment for the two ideologies to debate there. Yes. And that's kind of what the movie needs is for that last confrontation 
between killer and comic writer to be about fiction versus reality. Hey, Billy, it's shown up to a debate between two heavyweight debaters that get to have their opening statement and then that's time up. Right, right. You know what and I mean? The opening statements are like, you smell like farts. Yeah, well, you suck. <laughs> All right. Well, we thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> well, let me pivot to a shudder thing that I really, really like. Please do. Um, and Pegor. I, I've yet to watch it, but it's it's the guy who did Satan Slaves recently, yeah. and I really like that. Yeah, I think Impetigo is a better movie. Oh so, well, shit! All right, I think on. we we I think we are. Did I you see we, Duncan? Before you go any further, yeah. I have to ask you. In comparing the two, you mm-hmm. do recall the scene of the child going under the bus in Satan <laughs> Slaves, right? Because that's one of the fucking craziest things I ever saw. So, all I'm going to see is skinless babies. Fair enough. All right, done and done. Let's do it. Uh, So, um, yeah, so uh, this is Joko Anwar who did um, Satan Slaves, which was a remake slash sequel slash something of Satan Slaves from the 80s. He's kind of the big name currently in Indonesian cinema. Um, I believe he has made some movie in between these two which is not genre at all i think it's like a comedy or something uh which i kind of love i think i think the the greatest directors are the ones that can just go right here's my horror film right i'm gonna do a comedy now and oh you know what horror film um but this one feels not necessarily tighter but feels more confident it's about an hour and 45 minutes in length and it breathes I, i mean it has one of my favorite like opening sequences to a movie in a while in that I thought I was watching a slasher movie. I had one of the greatest cold open slasher mov- movie scenes I have seen in a long time. And um, then it goes completely in a different direction. Uh, and I won't give away too many details, except that two people, um, two young, uh, well, two young ladies uh, travel to uh, kind of, uh, to be honest, I think Indonesian horror is maybe, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years behind what everything else is it's like they've only just discovered movies like the ring like last week <laughs> right, like, right. Oh, these movies are great make them yeah. and i'm cool with that i'm cool yeah, with that, that because <laughs> those movies have been so far away for so long now that when these movies come in with a fresh take i'm like that this feels refreshing <laughs> yeah i want to watch this so uh, yeah um, at the time i said that satan slaves was like it, somebody had seen uh the conjuring uh-huh. and was like oh i can do a better one of those yeah, as uh, they feel they feel older and almost in in the way they're telling their story, and I, I I'm totally down with that. But um, we find this girl who finds it that she's relatives who have left her this large house in the middle of this kind of very rundown shanty village um, that you know has a bit of a dodgy past, and she thinks that what she can do is go there, posing as a essentially as like a university student and find out if she can get some information about these this extended family that she knew nothing about uh, and when she arrives there she finds it very very quickly that all the locals are to say fucked up would be an understatement um maybe satan worshippers and there is a curse on the town um that curse meaning that any newborn child is born skinless um and that's where i'll leave it <laughs> so, uh, um, really, really, really good. I mean, I, I, I thought it has one of my favourite openers in a movie that I've seen in a long time. The closing scene in this movie is maybe one of my favourite closing sequences I've seen this year. Um, oh, wow. All and right. that is, like, when it, when it finished, I was like, holy fucking shit. Um, and in between, you get you get great acting, you get gore, you get ghosts, you get, like, there's tons of stuff happening here, and a really good mystery that works in there. There's a bit of the Wicker Man in there as well, this kind of idea of folk horror uh, and kind of occultism in this small village but nowhere else, and our characters are trying to stumble their way through it. There's a bit of everything flung here, but it holds together very, very well. Like I say, great performances, shot beautifully. I mean, this this looks like a lot of money's been spent on it. And is bookended by two of my favourite 
Uh, two of my favourite sequences that I've seen this year, that are right up there. Um, yeah, Joko Anwar is no joke. Uh, he is not a joke Anwar. He's Joko Anwar. <laughs> oh, I don't no. know why I did that. Hate myself. Hate myself. Um, <laughs> I, I just feel like I should be in that meme where Gordon Ramsay has two bits of bread either side of my head. Call me an idiot sandwich. Um, but yeah, I think <laughs> uh, I think it's I think it's brilliant. I don't think it's. I, I, let me temper it by saying I think it's brilliant, but I don't think there's anything necessarily new about it. If you know what I mean, I don't think it's reinventing the wheel or bringing anything new to the table. But I think what it is doing is showing that he is a very, very powerful new voice in Asian horror cinema, and he has me. He had me in with Satan Slaves. I thought Satan Slaves was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, I think this one just beats it out, just just a little bit in that it it seems like, and he wrote this one as well. So this is his first original. Kind of, he's not he's not taking he's not remaking something or anything. This is his first original movie, uh, with you know his writing and, and all all the stuff there. And it's uh, yeah, I think it's very 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 good. I gave it a four point five out of five on the old Netflix scale. And I think if I watch it later on in the year, it might edge up a wee bit more. So uh, yeah, and Pet Gore is exclusive on Shudder though. So once again, um, get yourself a Shudder subscription. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money and you get seven days free, I think it is. So even if you want to jump across, check the two movies we spoke about and cancel your subscription there. You can do that as well. So Yeah. Um, you can go to shutter.com uh, forward slash DBCC. And, <laughs> Which will and, get you to uh, this link is not recognized. Yes. But if enough people do it, then maybe they might ask why. Right. And then they'll be like, hey, it's it's time we got on the DBCC train. Yeah. If they aren't already, Bo, they're lurking. They hear us. We know you're there. Look, a after they gave Joko Anwar another movie, clearly they listened to us <laughs> about Satan's <laughs> slaves. Um, <laughs> well, this idea of like, do, do we give him another go? But did you hear the DBCC rating? It was super high. Yeah, uh, they they uh, love the it. hot or not scale. They give it a hot. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers <laughs> to Satan's slaves, says Duncan Boke up correct. <laughs> let, let me pivot. Let me pivot. To, so I had these lofty dreams and aspirations that I was going to start the haunting of uh, of um, Thingy House. It's escaping me. The haunting of Hill House. And, um, oh, right. All these other, yeah, all these things I was going to do in the interim, which I've not done. Right. So. Oh, I, I thought a haunting of Hill House was going to be your bad. I was like, holy shit, Duncan, no. what's no, happened to so, you? I don't. I don't necessarily have a bad out with the the kind of the obvious things that you know kind of pretend that a bad for me, and that I watch a ton of movies and different series like sure. for my show, and some of them are just naturally not very good. And I could go down that road, and it doesn't feel fitting. Instead, what I've been doing is I created. I, I created Bo, a list of must-see TV from the last two years that I have not seen. And it turns out there is 42 TV shows on that list. So now with a list in tow, mm -hmm. um, I, I have started picking them off um, in an order which will frustrate you because Hot and Hell House should have been on there first, but it's somewhere down uh, about five or six on that list. Um, and that I've picked shorter ones to pick off so I can build up a bit of momentum. It's never great to start off like, if you hadn't watched telly in years, and this is not me and you, because we would do this, mm. and you were trying to get back into something, you wouldn't start with, like, the X-Files, right? Because it's too long. Right, you need, you, <laughs> you right. It, you need a momentum. little an aperitif, yeah. Yeah, you need you need some momentum. So, uh, yesterday, um, I finally gave that BBC Dracula a whirl. Oh, um, sure. And that I was overjoyed to see it when it came out in New Year over in the UK, but didn't do it because... Believe it or not, prep started then for the summer series back in January. So finally sat down, finished it. So right through the three-part miniseries, which is about five and a half hours, I think. It's like mm -hmm. one and a half hours each episode. Um, and I think I like it more than most people like it, but I do still have issues with the third episode, which is where everyone has issues with the show. Have you seen it? Yeah, I have. Uh, right. And I, I think you and I might agree. Everybody everybody was like, that third episode is shit. I totally disagree. <laughs> and I was like, the third episode is not as good as the first two, yeah. but it's fine. Yeah, and I, I think, once again, talking about raising interesting questions, I think it raises quite a few interesting questions and modernizes the story of Dracula whilst bringing in characters that we expect 
whether it's Mark Gattis playing Renfield or, you know, his encounter with the character Lucy, but in a modern setting. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we get we get all those those things. Um, I, like, overall, I, I it scores very, very, very high for me. I think it's it's kind of wonderfully wicked in a way that I, 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 I found myself enjoying as it... F- as it went on further um i think the casting of the central dracula character is fucking genius like absolutely genius because he's not he's not too attractive but he's not ugly right and there's something about him and the way he talks and the way he acts that over time there is a kind of weird charm to him and i love this idea of like regardless how many times characters try and put up a fight using weapons against him he's just basically going to sit and talk to you because one of you will crack and that's mm-hmm. all he needs is one and that to me is just I, I love those aspects of it um i think the the making the van helsing character originally a nun um i think is divine i thought that was excellent um and as much as I loved it, the first episode, I thought the first episode was brilliant, recapturing all those elements of, you know, Dracula that we know from the movies and the book and stuff. To me, the stuff that played out in the second episode on the boat was where the show hit a new level for me. I thought the second episode was, was fucking brilliant. Because um, the cat and mouse game is very real and you're halfway through it before you realise that the conversations that are happening between the nun and Dracula are maybe not what you think they are. Mm-hmm. And I think the reveal of that is really cleverly done. Um, and the way that that episode ends is brilliant. And then the third episode moves it to modern day. And I think there's a really interesting conversation, which we see in some movies that are vampire adjacent. We've spoken about this on our vampirism conversation earlier on in the year, which, by the way, Go and check that out because I thought we did really good work there. And I'm not just saying that because it was me and you chatting. But this idea of um, eternal life, uh, the change, changing of society, um, and how that would have an impact on someone who was so old uh, and their ability to acclimate or adjust or, or certainly just even critique where the world is at now. There's, there's some brilliant dialogue in this movie about you know dracula basically saying that that there isn't there's nothing left to know now you've you've quantified it you've you know archived it it's all on the internet it's at a touch of a button now the only thing that isn't the only great mystery is death um and that speaks more to him as an immortal than it does necessarily to humans Mm. um and i I love those aspects yes it gets a bit goofy (laughs) um as mark gatiss is right now though um, Mark Gatiss writes, he, he was in the League of Gentlemen, and that's darkly weird. Um, and obviously did Sherlock, and Sherlock at times could be a bit weird. Uh, so th- to me, that didn't, it didn't put me off because I'm used to that sense of humour. So when it arrived in it, I kind of flowed with it. I think the ending's maybe not as strong as it necessarily should be, although I, I enjoyed the finality it brought. Um like the the reveal of of like what what underpins Dracula's fears was kind of interesting, but didn't really explain anything. At the same time, kind of left the door a bit open. I didn't feel like an overall satisfying explanation, while it did answer some stuff. Um, but yeah, as a three part dating a uh, BBC <laughs> miniseries, it was surprisingly vicious, <laughs> like really, 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 really grim. When you've got like vam- uh, vampire, uh, kind of vampire, you know, undead babies, um, you- you've already got me interested, Bo. Um, when you keep doing that shit, that's when it gets even more interesting. And there are a couple of really creepy scenes of horror in there, but I, I liked the journey that it went on. So, like I say, I don't think it was flawless. Um, but at the same time, in a world where, uh, and we've spoken about this before, the actual Dracula side of things doesn't really interest me anymore. It's all the 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 kind of other stories that you can tell about vampirism and its effects. It's where my interest lies. The fact that the show managed to bring me back uh, says a lot about it. So yeah, that is my, it's not bad, but it wasn't great. Um, 
watching in between. And trust me, there will be a ton of working through this list as we speak. I've already moved on to the next TV show that I'm picking off. So um, maybe by the next time, we'll, we'll have watched The Haunted Hill House. We'll never have watched it by then, but maybe we'll. <laughs> yeah. Disclaimer, Duncan won't do that. Maybe we'll. <laughs> It's just just to tease me at this point. As I've said a number of times, you're only hurting yourself. Um, I know for a fact I love it when I watch it. Um, and it, it has to happen soon because they've announced the release of the release date of season three. Uh, season two, sorry. Which means I ne- I want to have that out of the way so I can watch it. Like the ordinary people do, Bo. Episode to episode when it's released. You know, this is going to be one of those things where you end up watching Bly Manor before Hill House. Oh, I'll hate myself if that yeah. happens. Boy. Right, and I think you'll do it just to spite me. Well, now you've put the idea in my head, that's all I can think about. <laughs> so, but before we get off Dracula, or Dracula mm-hmm. gets off, you know what I'm no, saying? Hello. Can, ha- hi um, It's worth pointing out how amazing Dolly Wells is as Sister Agatha. Oh, she's amazing. Like, she's like my favorite character, in it? Right. As much as Dracula, uh, what's his name, Kleis Bang, or whatever his name yeah. is. Who is amazing as Dracula. He's still Dracula, though, to get the kind of, like, the twist and a new, kind of, a new telling of the, the Van Helsing character. She's fucking brilliant. Like, every scene she's there, I'm like, yes! <laughs> right. I'm with you. I'm Team Agatha. Yeah, I mean, the the first time you see her in the in the convent, when she's just kind of fucking with Jonathan Harker. And you're like, wait a second. Like, what does she know that he does it? Yeah. Because it was great though. You're right. <laughs> yeah. And it, it is a great moment. And it, and her character establishment is so great. And like you said, that cat and mouse in the second episode and the mm. conversations between the two of them, like she, to me, she was the revelation of, of the show was how good mm-hmm. Dolly Wells was. Um, and and I know she's done some like comedy show with Emily Mortimer that sounds charming, and I bet it's wonderful. And I've never seen it, <laughs> but and probably never will. But it sounds yeah. like one of those things <laughs> that would be like, like watching it would be like the smell of baking, you know, mm, of just yes. like ah, oh, this is so comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, which by the way, made a, a coconut custard pie that really came out very very nice, bo right? nice, bo Ransdell. Look at him. Oh, let me tell you about a mustard shallot sauce that I made recently. <laughs> that was a fucking winner. Um, but before we do that, Duncan, it's time for my uh, best movie. Before we get Ooh. to recipe sharing. On, yeah, before on, we get to the Duncan and Bo's Bake Off in the middle section. And, holy shit. Uh, now that has to happen. <laughs> I mean, you're the expert. I But I have I have been cooking a lot more and a lot more elaborately of late. Yeah, well, you're afforded a bit more time in the house. That will happen. <laughs> it certainly will. Every Saturday, we've been cooking meals from around the globe, and mm. um, it's got this. It's this little tradition now that, like, me and my wife take turn about, and um, like, I love it. Like Saturdays come around, and like, like, where are we, where are we going on the map? tonight you know what i mean and then learning how to make a, a brand new dish from scratch and seeing it all turn out and sometimes not um you know like it's, it's excellent so yeah we, we, we i mean we'll get to that bo but you said something about a, a good movie and i am interested to see where your journey is taking you bo hands down in the last week i am going to recommend a movie that sounds like it it should not be for me <laughs> oh dear um <laughs> right. but absolutely was it is uh, a movie in which uh, Shia LaBeouf, Shy the Beef, as he's known around here. <laughs> Le Beef. Uh, <laughs> so, Le Beef, <laughs> do you have the juice? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> what movie that no, is. No, <laughs> I do not have the juice. <laughs> yeah. Man, no. You can take the juice and shove them right up your ass. <laughs> I'm now want to say this. We're going to christen this character Shia LaBeau. Um, <laughs> love it. So, anyway, he plays a a fisherman on like the uh, South Carolina coast of the U.S. Very, very like rednecky kind of kind of place. Mm-hmm. And his brother has recently died. There's some indication that he feels responsible for that. Uh, or at least very much stranded by that in life. And uh, uh, ends up making some bad decisions where he blows up a dock uh, of some rival fishermen. 
and he's he's escaping but is joined in his escape by a young man who has down syndrome oh this is on netflix yeah it's called the peanut butter falcon yeah this has got great reviews and uh th- this young man has a videotape of a wrestling school that is run in georgia or something so they're they're moving south mm-hmm. and uh they end up taking this journey on a raft a la Tom Sawyer. And for about half of it, Dakota Johnson is along for the ride. Mm-hmm. Um, from You remember her from The Suspiria. Yes, I do remember her from The Suspiria. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it's uh, Thomas Jane plays the old washed-up wrestler that they're going to visit and stuff. Which, and- I mean, that's, you have me sold when you say Thomas Jane and Old Southern. That's, you know... Yeah, he's... And- He's not in it a ton, but he's in it enough to be like, all right, I see where all of this is going. But it, it it's a very, it feels like a very cookie cutter kind of tugging at the heartstrings kind of movie. Uh-huh. But what the movie does is it makes the characters all feel very, very real, even though the situation is kind of fantastic in its way. Um, there is a, a reality to the characters. The movie isn't saccharine uh, mm-hmm. about the way that it, it shows, the, especially the relationship between Shia, Shia LaBeouf, <laughs> Shia the Beef, and his <laughs> brother, who is played by The Walking Dead's John Barenthal. Oh, um, right. That's but it. he's in it for like a couple of minutes in flashbacks, but mm-hmm. it's just little moments and little conversations between them, and you understand what's happened Without the movie ever having a character be like, well, listen, Shia LaBeouf, here's what happened between you and your brother. <laughs> and it, it's kind of nice that it, it sort of evolves sort of naturally in, in terms of you understanding all of these characters. And and like the 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 young kid, or not kid, he's a, a, a man, he's an adult um, mm-hmm. with Down syndrome. Uh, but his parents like completely abandon him and he lives in a, a nursing home at the beginning and his mm-hmm. roommate is Bruce Dern. Oh fuck. There's like, 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 what? How do you get Bruce Dern and just like you tell first of all you tell him you don't have to stand up for this movie. You well, he's sit in, down the whole he's time. In, he's in here. <laughs> so, I love Bruce Dern. I he's really do. and he's great in it. He's kind of like this kid's sidekick sort of. Mm in terms of helping him escape where he's like, you want to get out of here, kid? Good. You know, (laughs) and just, you know, helping plot this escape and shit. It's all very funny. And, um, it, yeah, but it's a real, it's a really heartwarming movie without it being a movie that feels like it was meant to be heartwarming. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Like it, it comes by it honestly. And when you get to the end of the movie, it's not a great big, now we all have a house to live in, you know, it's yeah. not like that kind of ending, but it ends in a place where it's like, oh, I feel, even though at the end of this movie, slight spoilers, Shia LaBeouf is beat to ever live in fuck at the end of this movie <laughs> to the point where like he can barely open an eye and, but that's like a really optimistic ending yeah. for it for that character and and it's uh, a a really wonderful sweet movie that uh I, I i think speaks to me because it's just about a bunch of broken people kind of finding one another mm-hmm. and and sort of all accepting each other for being broken and, and, and you said that shia labeouf is beaten up like someone is maybe tenderizing their labeouf <laughs> you know here's the thing about shia the beef <laughs> is that he got uh he got hot early mm-hmm. and he was good but then he lost his mind because he got so famous you almost sounded like hey, listen here you got good you see see it's all okay yeah i got good i got good but i got too quick you see bring in shy the beef listen kid <laughs> your name is mud on the streets you hear me there's not a it's not a decent director alive that wants you on his set it went it went weird, but it went weird in a way where someone like Lars von Trier was like, "Yes, be in my movie, <laughs> strange, the strange man." And like watching like the highlight clips of him watching back all his movies, like in the cinema, and kind of just seeing him go through like joy, despair. What the fuck? What was that? I was in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, 
It's one of those, I don't know, I think he's a, I think we need eccentric actors, like, on occasion. I think Nicolas Cage is the classic example of that. Nicolas Cage hits the, you know, the mark, hits the target, like, one every, like, 15 movies. But when he hits it, it's it's kind of like, why can't he just do movies like this all the time? Why do they have to do all that as well? And then you realize, because of... Taxes. Yeah, taxes. He has to do all this stuff he doesn't want to do. Um, uh, I think you're right, there. as a though. result, he will ham up. And, but look, look, Shia LaBeouf, like, to me... I don't... I, even, I don't like the Transformer movies at all, right? But he's likable in it. So, I mean... I, I, I mean, that's that role, isn't it? Be likable, awkward teenage boy. Shia LaBeouf, Disturbia, be awkward, you know, <laughs> be awkward teen who can't enjoy himself, look out the window, be, be suspicious. He can do that. Um, and um, Nymphomaniacs Part 1 and 2, be sexually, sexually perverted, strangely weird. But he can do that. So I think he's he's good at I think the problem is, as a person, he would, he just, we, we saw that collapse. <laughs> like in yeah. real time and it's difficult at that like it's so easy to see someone go through that and kind of write them off that when the stars align and they get a project which really speaks to them and I, I don't think it's a stretch for Shia LaBeouf to play you know broken character trying to <laughs> pick up the pieces sure. or find a place and that's not going to be a stretch for him um but I think he's I, I still to this day think would I would I have written them off so much if he hadn't been in that terrible Indiana Jones movie? I mean, I don't know. But then there were so many other actors in that, just in that movie fucking making a state of themselves. Kate Blanchett, I'm looking at you with your fucking horrendous, <laughs> racist, Russian, Russian accent. Jesus Christ. What are you talking about, <laughs> Dr. Vodka? Yeah, it's so fucking bad. Honestly, so bad. But I loved um, it because that movie, like that movie, was utter camp, and at least she was campy in it. Yeah, the way like, she, like, oh, weirdly, she knew what movie she was in, but still, I mean, uh, we're she's getting, a good actress. <laughs> right, we're getting off the fucking point. The point is, Shia the Beef is a better actor than most people give him credit for, and I think yes. what you're right about is that he, in much the same way Nicolas Cage is, he is at heart a character actor. Yes. And yes. not a movie star actor. No. And so in something like the Peanut Butter Falcon, he's got this very, like, very grounded Southern accent that isn't over the top and like, well, y'all, you know, it's not that kind of Southern <laughs> accent. <laughs> oh, the Duke boys, they've jumped the crick. Um, that's what they do. My favorite episode. <laughs> yeah. In midair, like Waylon Jennings stops the screen. It's like... Round about this, it's time the Duke boys had found themselves in a whole mess of trouble. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I hope the General Lee's got wings. <laughs> down, 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 down. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the, the, yeah, I think you're right. He's, he's, a, he's a great, he's a, he's a very good character actor who has weirdly been blessed with movie star looks, right? And and kind of got. I mean, he was a really good actor as a kid. And mm-hmm. so got hot early and everybody wanted him to be a movie star. But really, he is most at home when he can just kind of inhabit a character, it seems yeah. like. And, and and so that's kind of what he does in Peanut Butter Falcon. And uh, it's, uh, like I said, very sweet movie. All, one correction, though, it's not Thomas Jane who is the uh, uh, the oh, wrestler. Oh, no, you're shooting it's, this for me here. Uh, let, me, um, let me correct it and give you one addition that's going to more than make up for this. So oh. it's Thomas Hayden Church who is the wrestler. Not Ooh, Thomas Jane, but oh. but still just as good. He's really good in that role. Mm. Also, uh, supporting role from John Hawks oh, as <laughs> as the kind of rival fisherman who is sort of in pursuit of Shia the Beef the whole movie. And what a bizarre <laughs> amalgam of actors! Right? Yeah, and also wrestlers Mick Foley and uh, uh, Jake the Snake show up in it yeah i mean they're haggard as fuck that's what <laughs> they i mean to- they totally are but they are like in they the movie them. as like backyard wrestlers yeah yeah that, that makes sense and it's i don't like somebody had to point out to me they're like no those are real wrestlers but uh i was like i don't know um but uh but it, it's really really well cast really well done 
uh, and, and when you see it, let me let me know what you think because I know you are traditionally uh, hard hearted. Yes, uh, but I I think <laughs> I think this one will get you because it's not it's not trying to be manipulative. It just is kind of a wonderful little sweet movie. Yeah, I mean, I I I, 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 I hard heart. I, I can still I, I can still identify if we are. This is the bit that it should be affecting me more than it is. Um, and you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like. I can identify it on the screen. I just can't relate. You've uh, you've been around humans enough to recognize, <laughs> like, oh, this is when they would laugh. Ha 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 ha. Yes. <laughs> like then. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. like right then. Like a chameleon bull. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. that's what you are. <laughs> a chameleon. Um, a chameleon. <laughs> hey, you you want to talk about some uh some Lovecraft country? Yeah, I don't think much happens in these two episodes. Man, all right, so at the end of the second episode, it's no shit. Uh, at the end of that episode, uh, yeah. the one we're about to talk about called Whitey's on the Moon is the name of it, yep. which is fucking great. Fucking uh, awesome. See the first episode when we talked all about how much I love uh, Gil Scott Heron, mm-hmm. uh, who did both this and um, uh, Re- The Revolution will not be televised. It won't be televised. Oh, bro. man, that's so good. You cannot afford <laughs> to stay home, brother. <laughs> It's oh, it's so fucking good. The revolution will not be televised. It's one of the best things that ever came out of the sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, <laughs> Whitey's on the moon's like top ten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, at the end of the second episode, I was like, "Is it done? Well, yeah, Are we I, I, done I, now?" Yeah, I, I can't... <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of like you. I was like, "Where do we go from here?" Like, because it almost felt like it almost felt like we were practicing tantric sex and just couldn't hold back on that last tug. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I was like, "Oh no!" Now we have to start all over again. Doug, um, <laughs> Doug was like, and- <laughs> "Where do we go? Where do we go now? Where do we go now? Where do we whoa, go?" Whoa, 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 sweet child of me, me, me. Sweet child of mean. <laughs> Listen here, sweet child of oh, mean. Sweet, sweet sons of Adam. Yes. Yeah. Oh, see, I love where everything is going right now. Mm-hmm. Everything is going. Everything's turning up, Duncan and Bo. Uh, yeah, well, I'm the same as you. It finished, and I kind of felt like, right, either this is like, once again, started the book, never finished the book, didn't get that far in the book, really want to go back through the book. But I did kind of get that feeling of, well, maybe the book is the first two episodes, and then from there we're going off and doing our own thing. Yeah. Um, which I mean, that's how it felt. It definitely felt like the conclusion of a story. And then I saw the this is what's coming up on episode number three, and I was like, I don't usually watch these, but I watch these. And when it finished, I was like, that. Oh yes, right, you've got me in. You've got yeah. me in. I completely got me in because it's a different take, but it's still very much. 100% grounded and everything we've just done. So, yes. I Yeah, I did the uh, exact same thing where I don't normally watch those because I'm like, ah, I, I'm, I like being surprised. Mm-hmm. But this was when I was like, what the fuck is, is it? Are they <laughs> digging up Uncle George in the next episode? <laughs> Spoilers. Um, Spoiler alert, bull. Yeah. I'm dead, goddamn it. <laughs> Got shot in the goddamn belly. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, when, and then when I saw what it was, I was like, Oh, they can do anything. They, they can do anything, Bo. And, like, <laughs> we're going to get into it, right? But episode three, you know, like, drops down some big old veiny Amityville cock on the screen. Yeah. And then just screams, look at it. Look at it's, it. All right. Let, let's let's start at the beginning here. Because yes. uh, we open on <laughs> Uncle George and Letty dancing yeah. around in the rooms that you know up here, are in this manner that they showed up at uh, uh, at the end yeah. of episode 1 Could you see Bo that they were moving on up Dude when they when they just start off with the Jefferson's theme in this episode It's the greatest thing ever And it's just a reminder that it's like man this show just fucking has the fucking balls on this show The fucking balls on this show Bo <laughs> Right and I and I love it. I love everything about these scenes. It is uh, it's, it's, just, it's as it's the it's the TV cinematic world confidence of a CEO arriving at a board meeting carrying a golf club. Yes, Why does he have the golf club? 
but he has it. That's how confident he is. He knows he's not going to use it in that meeting, but he has it anyway. Bro. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, my note there was just, I love this show. It's, <laughs> it, it is, and the rooms are filled with the shit they love for uh, Letty. It is it just clothes of, of all stripes that fit her all perfectly. All of them fit her perfectly boom uh for for uncle george it is every book that he ever wanted mm-hmm. uh which is a wonderful characteristic like i i love uncle george uh just as a character yep and we his, love him on ip and yeah his his love affair with literature and you know my favorite book is goddamn dracula <laughs> and <laughs> i like i like epistulary novels god damn it <laughs> Oh, you got a problem with that? Fight me. <laughs> you don't like epistolary novels? You ain't shit. God damn it. <laughs> Them's fighting words. <laughs> right. I don't know. I, I I just prefer straight prose. What? Flips a table. <laughs> His mustache is on edge. <laughs> <laughs> it even worked on the goddamn notebook. <laughs> That book is straight trash, but I could read every goddamn word of it because it was epistolary, goddammit. I like a passage followed by a date. <laughs> so, sh- so, shut up. I'm not editing these, uh, these as closely, so we can't afford to just laugh for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> So while that's happening, Tick, uh, while they're having a great time, Tick is fucking breaking down because he has been attacked by the unholy beast of the cosmic well, orb. Yeah, because the previous episode we left off with our characters being, you know, hunted to nigh extinction by these fucking horrible creatures, which were part vampire, like part like body full of eyes, uh, right, right from the pages of, Love, of Lovecraft's mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other two appear to have just like when you know shit happens, <laughs> <Right. laughs> may as well roll with it. While he is in this existential crisis of what did I see? What does this mean? We aren't the only things <laughs> on the world. Maybe Lovecraft was right. Maybe these things are real. If he was right about that, what else could he be right about? You know, just in this like constant, almost circle and cycle of of broken existence. Uh, and trying to piece together his fractured, fragile little mind from that. You've got to remember, he's just back from Korea mm. like, as well. He saw some shit over there, and yet this, you know, has not prepared them, both. Has not prepared them. Yet the other two are like, moving on up to the east and moving on up. You know, like, like right. oh, and- this is my favorite book, and this is my favorite book, and this dress fits me, and this dress fits me. Um, and it's such a stark con contrast and we can't work out why this is happening bro we're like that why are the other two not maybe i don't know <laughs> right why can't Tick make the screaming in his head stop <laughs> and then <laughs> and then a bell rings and then george and letty appear yes uh letty looking particularly fine in some kind of equestrian get up that she has fine. found no. and then william who's like the little nazi youth um, <laughs> yeah. that greet him at the door in the first yeah, episode. Yeah, Whitey McWhite uh, shows up. <laughs> yeah, like couldn't be any whiter. Yeah, um, and I mean albinos are darker than Whitey McWhite, right? So you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, you can. When he holds up his hand, you can see the skeleton. Um, <laughs> and then he shows up to escort him to lunch and gives him a ton of exposition about like, well, the the estate is run by the Braithwaites. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was originally built by Titus, who made his fortune in shipping. And immediately, Uncle George is like, you know that means slave running, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and just put it in there like, this guy was an asshole. Yeah. And, uh, and then William is like, oh no, he was notoriously kind to those who worked for him. Mm. And it's like, eh, that still sounds like he was just good to the <laughs> slaves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so there was a fire that killed the the venerable Titus Braithwaite. Yeah. And there was only Goodbye. one survivor. Only one bull. Right. We, mm. we do not name uh, right away. Mm. But uh, anyway, so we get all this backstory of, you know, the, the super wealthy uh, Titus Braithwaite, you know, kind of running uh, this down. And uh, at lunch, 
uh, they're kind of left alone. So it's, you know, Tick and Uncle George and, and Letty. And again, they're having a great lunch and chit-chatting and whatnot. And Tick's yep. like, ah, let's go take a look around the town. And uh, and William is like, look, just be back by dinner. You're not a prisoner here or anything. So, uh, you know, just it'd be back before dark is all we ask. Yeah, he's, al- he's also found out during this conversation that maybe... Uncle John and Letty um, can't remember anything that happened the night before. Right, right. Like, and at all. They're just like, hey, can I have some salt, please? <laughs> like, oh, oh, just totally just, mm, might as well enjoy yourself while we're here. And this is great. And oh, they're all, they're, you know what? The, the hospitality here is so incredible. And he's like, no one remember the police officers that were murdered in front of us last night by large marauding creatures covered in eyes. No, anyone? No, just me. Okay, and they're looking at him as if he's crazy. There's a bit where this pays off later on, and is maybe my favorite thing in this episode. Like hands down, just the the, the screams of anguish when yeah. all of a sudden memories are restored of that night. <laughs> like, and, ah! and a second occasion. Yeah, we'll get to it. But um, yeah, it's a lot of existential problems there. <laughs> A, a, a quick shout out to another great Letty moment, which this podcast we should just call great letty moments oh yeah and by the way that just can cont- that's the theme of the show uh the 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 roll right into episode three in a way which makes me love her even more yeah the, she's got two things in the third episode they're like god damn it yeah you uh, are amazing yeah. anyway <laughs> so there's a great moment here where uh <laughs> she rings the bell for a servant mm-hmm. and they're like what the fuck are you doing <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One, like, you know, hey, we we could be in trouble here. And also, you are a black woman ringing for a white person to come serve you. Mm-hmm. And But her her line, when they look at her, she goes, what? I need some salt. You know how white people don't be seasoned in their food? <laughs> Fucking great. <laughs> Beautiful. And... <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> there, so, is an, there is a distinct irony of white people not putting white things in their food enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> and so they, they go to uh, the the garage where they find Woody, which is mysteriously not damaged. Not damaged at all, bro. Suspicious, one would say. Right. And William McWhiterson is like. <laughs> Oh, it's fine if you want to go looking at the cars. <laughs> it's no trouble. That's how we found it. Mm. And and meanwhile, like, of course, Tick is like, no, no, no. This was crashed last night, which George and Letty can't remember. And you, <laughs> you were on the sauce, goddammit. I understand. <laughs> I get it. Sometimes I take a little nip. <laughs> <laughs> But our heroes then go to this village, which is like, ironically, the village from M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah. Brimley seems like the sort of guy that would take a nip from a hip flask while on the toilet taking a shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I, just, I don't know what, I don't want that image in my head, but now it's there. I just get that, like, we're going to be here for a while. May as well enjoy myself. Uh, just greasing the pipes. <laughs> Make sure everything yeah, arrive- comes out smooth, <laughs> goddammit. You know, I have this kind of, what I, first I thought was like a, a kind of, it, it's not even just that, it's, there's, there was something very pagan about the look of it, and you, we're going to get some more information about what the village may have been used for, though, mm-hmm. that in itself is kind of terrifying, um, but yeah, they're all kind of dressed in kind of yield timey get up, and um, they're walking through and they're all getting stared at because they're black, um, and this village is, for lack of a better word, white. And in the middle of it, though, there's this large kind of like stone tower, like the like something like you just see it and you go, "That oh, people get murdered in there." <laughs> like, right. That's a murder tower if ever I've seen one. <laughs> yeah. When I see it, <laughs> I I also like here that uh, as Tick is wandering around, like I know Dad's got to be uh, imprisoned here somewhere. And by the way, you hear that whistle? That's like the whistle that called off those monsters. Yeah, and while he's realistically explaining their situation uncle george and letty are like i think he's got shell shock god damn it he's <laughs> he's off his goddamn rocker <laughs> we're gonna have to hit him over the head with a coconut or a rock <laughs> when i give the signal which is two twitches of my mustache <laughs> when it goes left right left left 
<laughs> up, down, up, down, A, B, A, B. <laughs> so we unlock Letty's superpower and she karate kicks him to the forehead. That's right. My, my mustache and who's the goddamn Konami coat? Why wouldn't it? Now, let me ask you that question. Why would it not? In those pot of eight places. For exact them- measurements. <laughs> All eight of those places are stuck in his mustache where he's eating it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh, oh dear. Oh. But, <laughs> so, they, then uh, out comes a, a woman with a pair of snarling dogs. <laughs> and when you just hear when that happens. <laughs> yeah, and she's, she's a real pill. They, uh... <laughs> They're like, hey, this this big stone building here, what's in that? Is that a prison? And she's like, oh, no. That's just uh, where we keep the food. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you old timey Karen. Yeah. The character there with a couple of dogs. <laughs> and then she has this speech that is as thinly veiled a racist speech Oh yeah, as yeah. as you can get and still be somewhat veiled. She she's been to an RNC convention, but um, that's what she's been. <laughs> yeah, she's she's like we had to build this because the bears came in, mm-hmm. and Uncle George's like you're talking about grizzly bears, goddammit. And she's like, <laughs> no, you don't want a goddamn grizzly. <laughs> what you do is you put bells on your shoes, goddammit. Works like a charm. And and she's like, no. Just black bears mostly. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. when the blacks come in, mm-hmm. they're just beasts, you know? Mm. They're smart, but they're not smart, smart. And, like, meanwhile, they're all just like, oh, fucking this lady. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, after they all leave, they're like, there's a fucking dungeon in that place, and R- N- Natalie McRacist back there. <laughs> Is hiding something because if that place uh, is made of stone, it's got a dungeon, and that's mm-hmm. probably where Montrose, aka Omar, is being yes, kept. Yes, Omar. Mm. <laughs> yeah, while they're and in there looking at the wire. <laughs> yeah, while they're while they're in there looking around, they hear. <laughs> <laughs> is that Omar? No, is Omar in this show. <laughs> surely not that would be too cool um <laughs> anyway so they're cutting across the woods on their way back to the braithwaite manor yeah because they have to make it back in time because we're told not to stay out too late and to be back for dinner right and sun be setting bo <laughs> right and so they're trying to make it back and then the shagoths uh start stalking them again Yep. Um and while we see the Shagas creeping up on him, George is like Shagas sounds like a like an industri- like a techno industrial dance trip. You know what I mean? We should be Shagoth. Yeah, here here is the Shagas to do their interpretive dance representation of I am the lamb. I am the lamb? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just imagined that someone was doing a really dark like I, I made up the song. You know what I mean? If someone's doing a really well, dark... Well, that's how all songs... Song. Yeah, yeah, that's how all songs happen. They're just made up, Duncan. Yeah, well, I, I just imagine if someone was doing it, you know, as an, like, they, would, they would take a line from the Bible and then shove it in there and make it all ominous and shit. I'm on it, Goth. You need to stop to talking roll. because you're giving away the secrets of our band. I do need to... Like, yes, do not listen. <laughs> forget. Forget. <laughs> we'll, we'll cast that spell, Duncan, where our yeah. listeners will forget they ever heard about the Shagos. They're, they're yeah. like, they'll be like, man, that episode was an hour and 40 minutes long. There's no yeah. way. I only remember like yeah, they're going to stop at it. They're going to stop at it. And all of a sudden they're going to get moving on up, moving on <laughs> right. up to the east. I'm moving on up. Oh, this We've podcast. All these is... blurries that I've always wanted to watch. <laughs> this podcast is yeah. filled with all the impressions I love and all mm-hmm. the goofy jokes. And yeah. here's Duncan <laughs> laughing for 27 minutes. <laughs> That's how you would hypnotize them. It's just like a look clip of me laughing for 27 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's also the hidden track on the Shagas album. Yes, it is. It's also what happens when you play it backwards. It's just Bo doing his Brimley, um, complaining <laughs> a, complaining about his 
coconut custard pie <laughs> recipe and me laughing hysterically in the background. So I had not track. You're ruining your ne- needle, goddammit. <laughs> <laughs> and all right, so while, while the shotguns are stalking yeah. him, George is like, hey, no, so Titus was notoriously kind with Hannah, the slave who escaped the fire mm-hmm. and was an ancestor of yours. Huh. Hmm. I don't know math, but <laughs> things are starting to add up. Oh, I see what they did there. And like and then the shotguns attack, but they are called off uh, before they can eat our heroes by uh, Christina or Extina uh, Braithwaite. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then she tells uh, the, you know, the Karen, uh, she's yeah. like, hey. You need to take uh, take the younger Freeman to my father's laboratory and the rest to their rooms. Yeah. And then she's like, now let's ride, our tax. <laughs> yeah. As soon as she leaves, also, Letty and George are like, the f- why am I so dirty? Yeah. like Once again, memory just goes. Because um, like, <laughs> you get a feeling that Tick is quite happy that now they finally believe him that the shotguns are a real thing and then she rides off and they're like mm, why am I like he's like oh god damn it <laughs> oh come on <laughs> uh <laughs> was I rolling down a hill again god damn it sometimes I do that for fun <laughs> was I doing it again god damn it <gasps> wee wee <laughs> you ever you ever just shove yourself in a big tire and roll yourself down a hill, goddammit, it is. See if there's footage out there of Wilford Brimley when he was still alive, God rest his soul, and a giant tire rolling down a hill, then, like, nothing makes any sense anymore. <laughs> yeah, just a giant tractor tire. See if you can CGI that video and send it to me. I will be forever in your debt, listener. <laughs> Bouncing down a hill, goddammit. <laughs> so... <laughs> Meanwhile, in the lab, uh, the yep. bad guy from Ghost is having his liver removed. <laughs> the bad guy from Ghost. <laughs> Literally, I know him as well. Yeah. He's been in loads of things I've seen, but whatever. He's <laughs> like, you're the bad guy from Ghost. Yeah, Tony Goldwood is his name. He's a wonderful actor, but yeah, he uh, he's getting his liver removed. And uh, uh, it looks like there's like some priest doing a, a, a conjuring or something. But it turns yeah. out he's just having one of his be-robed henchmen cut part of his liver out. Yeah, well, Bo, if you're going to have minor surgery removing a part of a vital organ, you get one of your robed henchmen. Yeah, it's cheap. Uh, also covered <laughs> by his HMO. Yes, yes, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. <laughs> oh, my God, the bills. Uh, but <laughs> but Tick is watching all this happen as Extina is, is getting herself a drink. It's just like... Guess I'm just gonna lube up a little bit. It's gonna be fine. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. And <laughs> we cut away from the doings in the lab to Uncle George, who's kind of pacing around his in his room. He's like, "I'm pretty sure I forgot something. Goddamn it, I just can't remember mm. what I forgot." <laughs> and he finds a book uh, of the the House on the Borderlands mm-hmm. by H.P. Lovecraft, mm-hmm. which opens a secret passage. Yes. And all I want in this world, Duncan, is to someday find a secret passage that opens with a book. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Bo, one day I think from podcasting, we will be wealthy enough to have someone build it for us. I And especially one that leads to a secret library, which is oh, of what course. Uncle yeah, George goals. finds here. <laughs> Just, yeah, goddamn ha- hashtag, more books. Hashtag squad goals, Bo. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Oh my god! You know, even if we have to share it, it's a big enough place. I think we. Yeah, I think we, we. I think we get it some place that both of us can go to. That's about equal distance away. I'm thinking Iceland, or no Greenland. Greenland would be in between the two. We'll get it built on Greenland. There's not a lot of things there anyway, and then yeah. we can fly out there and vacay at our secret room, which is opened by ebook. Why on earth would I ever leave our estate once we're there? Well, that's the, well. This is, I mean, that's that's the plan, isn't it? It's the ultimate trap. <laughs> it's our folly, really. We build it knowing that we can visit whenever we want, but we never leave. So, right? Why on earth would we? We've got secret doors and shit. 
Yeah, well, this is the, but this is the the plight of George, isn't it? He opens up to a library that has everything you could ever want, right? And some things he didn't know he wanted, but guess what? He go do some reading. Yeah, he, he finds a off. book that is called Order of the Ancient Dawn. Yes, and it's like, oh, well, that sounds like Dianetics. <laughs> and then, and so uh, then the bad guy from Ghost is is being sewn up back in the lab. And uh, and he and he stands up after the rogue guy leaves, and it's like, oh, he's the real uh, villain of the of the show. Yeah, and uh, he looks at this painting as a a, a portrait, a por- not a portrait, is a picture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there wasn't an artist at the time uh, painting Adam as he named all the animals. That was uh, arguably did not happen. Mm-hmm. Um, oh dear, hot take. <laughs> hot take. That... Wait, well, I've alienated the, the RNC listeners uh, from the show, and now you're alien. Well, to be honest, let's cross over this. That's fine. Oh, just uh, wait till we get to the Aristotelians. <laughs> we will. We will undo their moral philosophy. Um, <laughs> Come at me, Illuminati! Come at me! <laughs> right, and all you Kantians with your nature of the good. I like the way you say Kantians and I say Kantians. That's what I meant. Ugh, fuck that. Yeah. Fuck anyway, yeah. enough Kant. of my my philosophy ramblings. So, uh, but it's him looking at this Adam uh, naming, naming creature shit. And mm-hmm. he's like, you know, at the beginning of time, everything had an order. Do you know what I mean, Atticus? Yeah. Um, and he's like, that. yeah, you mean everything knew its place. And he's like, right. <laughs> because I'm a villain. I'm the bad guy from Ghost. And he's like, my daughter, Extina, believes you can be of use to us. Now get the fuck out of here. Yeah, and that's all you need to know in that scene. He's yeah. like, all the inside is all you're getting from me. Stay tuned yeah. for later on. I'll have exposition later. <laughs> and then uh, Extina takes him back to uh, take back to his room. And she's like, listen, I'm a friend. You can totally trust me. <laughs> she talked to Valley like and, and he's <laughs> like... Want to get peppermint smoothies later? Okay. I just... Look, I'm going to have a couple of martinis and whatever my dad wants to do, my dad's going to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can't stop him. <laughs> it's so pushy. Just don't be a jerk. I'm, I'm your friend. <laughs> and anyway, uh, Atticus is like, well, if you're my friend... Why don't you turn off whatever it is that makes uh, Uncle George oh, and Letty That's a great forget. scene. So fucking good. And she's like, okay. So that, and then all you hear is, ah! <laughs> right. And then it's, it's so fucking good. Right. They start <laughs> screaming. He's stuck in his cell with like a force field now. Yeah, because we've got force fields. Well, but we kind of always have. Like from the first yeah, it's episode. Like, it's like portal force fields right up. and and also like when the truck hit or did not hit the silver sedan that was a force field thing and all yeah that it has stuff. to be goddamn force field boy goddamn force field <laughs> um and so while uh tick is like hey i'm stuck in my room somebody comes to extina and is like hey you told us to come get you when that thing was happening and she's like oh right i gotta get out of here smell you later and then she <laughs> she takes off and it turns out she's going to this barn where a cow's given birth to a monster. Mm-hmm. One of the Shoggoths. Yeah. Uh, our bass player, no doubt. And yeah. <laughs> you tell that by how long his fingers were. Uh, and also, he just naturally had a groove. He did. He did come out with a funky beat. Anyway. Uh so when and she like Exina is like, oh my god, it's so pretty, and is like hugging it, and all the people around her are smiling too, and they're like, oh, is this your first time? And she's like, it totally is. This is wonderful. Totally. <laughs> so, <laughs> then, I'm so glad she's sticking around in this show now. So yeah. <laughs> then <It's> voiced by <laughs> voiced and this particular series is voiced by Bo's impression of Paris Hilton and I love it yeah it's so hot it's, it's hot. so god everyone's talking about Atticus and what he can do I'm so excited <laughs> um, <laughs> I just want to hang out with him you know just pick his brain 
So, so Letty, meanwhile, is trying to jimmy the lock. He's like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. And then someone uh, is outside the door. So she hides around the corner of this like wardrobe with the mm-hmm. knife in hand. Like, I'm going to stab whoever it is that comes through this door. Yeah. Which should made- be me. That's exactly what I would do. And that's what Letty would do as well. So we're sticking to a character. And because you're Letty? Is that what I'm led to believe? No, that and that. You put me in a corner, bro. You put me in a room, I'm coming to stab you. Nobody puts room, baby in a corner. That's... That no one puts me in a corner, bro. <laughs> Unless you want to get stabbed. Or or wants to do a pet, pet, <clears throat> Patrick Sweezy-esque dance. Oh, yeah, that. Yep, no. Oh, every time. You know, Duncan, every time we do a show, it's the time of my life. Oh, there you be. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, shut up. Because it's tick at the catching door. Who? Who's catching who in the... In the, in the finale of I dance. feel like I'm the bottom there. <laughs> Agreed. Uh... Oh. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> so, it's Tick coming through the door, and, and Letty fortunately doesn't stab him in the throat. And uh, he, uh, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't believe you. The memories are all back. And he's like, yeah, I know. And there's a picture in the room of this demon with a snake dick. Yes, snake dick. And I observed that and I was like, that's an unusual picture. And oh my God, right, there's and, a penis dick. And, snake cock thing. Snake cock. Snake Sna- cock. One, one of my favorite Van Damme movies. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme is back. Snake cock. <laughs> I was going in there so I realized I can't do Van Damme at all, like, even a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And I stop my, I stop myself. Really, I'm, I'm going, going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hurt you. I can kick you like this. I'm going to kick you in the face. Yeah. Oh, Shia, Le- uh, Shia LaBeouf can do it though. Yeah, that's my impression of Shia LaBeouf doing an impression of Jean Claude Van Damme. I love it. Yeah, I love it. It's three D chess. <laughs> um, but it's the inception of impressions. <laughs> yeah oh that top's always gonna spin duncan <laughs> um but so tick is is trying to cheer her up he's like look i know you're scared right now but uh remember this and he kind of recites the, the prayer that uh she used in the previous episode when she was mm-hmm. afraid before she ran for the car and um she says you know i'm in that that scared since uh one time my mom used to come home with a lot of men then one night she didn't come home at all and Mm -hmm. that stretched into a couple of weeks and when my mother was gone i would sit in the window of the boarding house and i would recite that prayer and hope that she came back and tick is like don't worry baby i won't ever leave you yeah and then i'm suddenly like that i'm telling cut the fucking sexual tension in here with a Blade bull. Man. <laughs> Big old saw. <laughs> From the first episode, we were like, we need to see these two fuck. These yes. two fucking human specimens <laughs> need to be <laughs> fucking in front of my eyes. Yeah, Th- This show is made or broken on the premise that if we see them fuck, this show is gold. <laughs> this show is hot. If they don't, it's a knot, bull. Yeah. It's a knot. Cheers. Cheers to episode two. No <laughs> fucking... Cheers to episode three. And giving it the thumbs down. Yeah. So anyway, uh, while he's making time with uh, with Letty, or so we believe. I believe we call that the fuck eyeball. Yeah, there's some real like, are we about to get down? I think we're about mm-hmm. to get down. And meanwhile, in Tick's room, there's Tick. Wait one second, boy. Oh. I thought you said he was in with Letty making the fuck eye. Yeah, but we spin around the mansion and he's still stuck in his room talking to George through the wall using Morse code where yeah. uh, Uncle George has written down wizards. Yes, which, uh, I mean, if you're not writing wizards down just randomly like on any given day, then you're not living well. Yeah. I like so many of my explanations, like I sometimes, like at my work, I have to do a bit of problem solving with data for customers. And there is a part where I'll have a big flow chart written out, what the problem is, um, all the different systems it goes through, what the output should be. And I'll have a conclusion bubble. And so many times I'll just write in there, wizards. I mean, if you can get them. Yeah, they fix anything. They're like the uh, duct price. tape of the magical world. <laughs> they have the duct tape. <laughs> Deploy the wizard. 
Alakazam, control, alt, delete. Hey. There we go. Your problem's fixed. Jimmy, you yeah, got a dude. wizard in a truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah get, get him in here. It's, uh, it's going to take a wizard. <laughs> this man's septic tank is far too gone for traditional human means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ah, Archimedes, can you fix this? <laughs> yes, I can, Alakazam. <laughs> Abracapocus. <laughs> <laughs> oh nope, that overflowed it. But the other way, <laughs> Hocus Cadabra. Thank you, Archimedes. <laughs> what the world do we paint? Man, so, it's like, so, people live there for like a day. Service oh. so fast, you'll think it's magic because it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just a guy in the background pulling things at a hat like you like you've got a plumbing problem a plunger comes at his hat you've got a problem with your 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 infrastructure like all of a sudden there's a digger comes at you <laughs> knock out and a fucking abacus comes at his bag i love it both it does anything anything you want yeah. Archimedes the wizard uh, yeah it's a swiss army wizard you can use him for yeah. anything <laughs> swiss army wizard needs to be a movie yeah oh my god archimedes conjure me a toothpick as you wish. <laughs> you know, I understand the uh, celestial bodies and the construction of time and temporal mechanics. Yeah, I need a toothpick. <laughs> Sesame seeds stuck right at the back. I can, I can give you untold wealth and power <laughs> with a, a wave of my hand and a chanting of my tongue. <laughs> I can just a toothpick. <laughs> You can you can see nations bow before you. I love that so many of our great characters are suddenly struck with menial tasks that break their will. Yeah. Um it's it's great. They all end up the same way in the yeah. Bowl's world. <laughs> yeah. Uh it's just that the curse of middle age, I suppose. Just, <laughs> the moment you realize it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, it's all yep. it's all coming for us. Where, where, where dreams are played. <laughs> replaced with cold hard reality <laughs> right don't get the bull come correct come in your come in your way every week where where we don't mean to compromise we just do <laughs> um <laughs> but anyway while interrupting this little conversation about wizards that they're having through the wall oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um tick here someone uh near the door in his room and he goes to check it out and then somebody just starts shooting through the fucking door Yep. And in comes Jia, uh, who apparently is a Korean soldier that he fought yep. in the war, one presumes, mm -hmm. and also yeah. is the voice we heard on the phone in the first episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, he has to fight for his life here. Yeah. And he obviously doesn't want to, but, like, Jia has taken no nose here. <laughs> right. She's doing one mission, which is death to death to the black man so she's coming at him hard one of them is trying not to murder the other yes the other yes. one is not playing by those same rules no, yeah the other one didn't get that updated <laughs> rule book <laughs> so so they start wrestling and then we see what what's up with uncle george which you could argue uncle george maybe gets the best out of the three deals sure yeah <laughs> yeah it, uh, look I, I, i'm an old man i can't do snake dicks and and <laughs> fist fights how about some slow dancing although i would argue here of the three characters here wilford brimley would be the most adequately prepared for snake dicks or well come on let's be honest we've seen him in movies where he has to take out snakes and make booby traps out of them that happened in a real movie ladies and gents yep. um, and wilford brimley was in it and to take down soldiers once again brimley can do it my yeah. money's on brimley yeah, it, it, it's true. They're really wasting my talents. I could snap the neck of that GI girl and probably strangle her to death using the snake dick if I this if I want to kill two birds. <laughs> it's like it's like Wilford Brimley's version of the the movie version of the Equalizer, where he sees the characters coming and anticipates how he take them down in four moves. Right. I grab the snake dick first, rip it out by its root. <laughs> Now, trip up the woman and then strangle over the dick. <laughs> that's going to be eight goddamn seconds. <laughs> so I'm giving you a choice, goddammit. 
you give me a slow dance or I will murder all of your ghosts. <laughs> and they're like, all right, all right, you get the dance. All right, God. You get, you get the dance. Yeah, like, because the thing is, like, in the previous episode, um, we remember that Uncle George had phoned uh, Hippolyta to say, you know, next time we come out and do one of these, you know, I want you to come with me. And there's that. We've said it before. They are the, the most adored couple in mm-hmm. the history of TV. It's just like a, it's like a proper grounded love. And obviously she appears and they start having this very meaningful conversation as they're slow dancing. But Uncle George is wise beyond this year's Bo Ramsdell. Oh, yeah. And maybe he starts to put together that maybe things aren't like we see. Yeah, he's like, you're not real, goddammit. But how about you give me a little bit of that ass anyway? <laughs> that, he doesn't say that exactly. But he, he he's... <laughs> uh, she's like, yeah, let's let's dance anyway. He's like, well, all right. I mean, if I'm stuck in this illusion, I might as well get me a little grope. Yeah. And then, so we cut from that to Letty, who is getting hot and heavier with Tick. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, by the way, is getting stabbed in the shoulder in his room. <laughs> One of them is not having the best time compared to the other two at the moment. And that right. character is the one who never lost his memories to begin with. You could see that this show is shitting on Tick. And continues to do so. But yeah. so then then we come back to George, who's talking about the, the house on the Borderlands, the Lovecraft story, which is all mm-hmm. about a guy who goes to this ancient village and but and then moves on to uh what is it the land of sleep or whatever it is where he's reunited mm-hmm. with his lover and um is and, and then at the end of it a building collapses which is like here's what's going to happen in the rest of the episode yeah <laughs> i got a great a great like level of uh foreboding inevitability um which, once again, I love, we mentioned it in the, the previous episode as well. The show isn't backwards at saying, look at this book here. This episode's kind of going to, it's going to emulate a lot of what you see in here. So these are not just, oh, we're just mentioning things as, as kind of reference points. These are specific indicators to how episodes will turn out, which I once again think is great. Yes. So. And so all of this builds to this climax happening in all these rooms where, uh, Uncle George gets off easy where he's just like, well, uh, bye, Dora. Well, I guess I'll see you later, goddammit. <laughs> he's only like got a peck on the cheek and walk out, walk out of the door, say goodbye, air close that door, and that's his nightmare over. Right, like if, if this ghost of Christmas past had ever visited Ebenezer Scrooge, he'd still be a skin flint. Like, what, <laughs> yeah. what a perfectly lovely time. He closes the door and he's like, I don't know how I survived that. Right. <laughs> um, meanwhile, though, Letty is getting a snake dick uh, like Tick pulls down his pants and it's the demon snake dick. Yep, the and, demon snake dick. <laughs> and <laughs> it's crazy. And then as he's coming after her, she just grabs a knife. Mm-hmm. And we cut away from it, but the implication is pretty clear. Yep. Uh, that she just stabs this snake dick to death. Yeah, <laughs> and lops off. And then uh, Tick is murdering Gia. Yes. And to death, Bo. <laughs> yeah. Sh- strangling her to death. Mm. And the, the, Uncle George is just alone in a room where he looks at a mirror and we get a, a shot where it's like, oh, these uh, cultists are in this room that's sort of a viewing room where they can see everything happening in all these rooms. So they're mm-hmm. using these people as entertainment. Yeah. There's a lot of rapid hand motion underneath the robes. Yeah, they're all yeah. spinning it like, oh, when, when he had to choke out that Korean girl. <laughs> um, but then a dinner bell rings, Duncan. Yeah, which will always make your dick limp. Because <laughs> hunger, <laughs> boy. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> need to go and feed. Must eat, then fuck. <laughs> that is, that is, um, <laughs> by the way, the Hulk translation of eat, drink. Uh, <laughs> man woman it's, it's eat, eat love. fuck crush is that what you're telling me <laughs> eat crush sleep <laughs> fuck eat crush sleep fuck I'm sure a David Lynch character has said those words in that order in that voice before <laughs> <laughs> yeah one, one of those ghosts from the, the third season uh, yeah 
Straight up there with a light. <laughs> We've spent too much time together. Eat, eat crush, sleep, fuck. <laughs> this oh. is the water, and this is yeah. The that's water. like the cliff notes of that monologue. <laughs> <laughs> Eat, crush, sleep, fuck. The, uh, all right, so <laughs> I uh, I have to. Do, I, I we mentioned this uh, on the Facebook page at some point, <sighs> and uh, it, it's an article that I I, I saved because I wanted to bring it up on this show, and you have given me the perfect segue. Mm-hmm. There was an article that kind of made the rounds. It was an old clipping from when David Lynch was uh, working on some movie, and. And here is the the news report. Ooh. David Lynch is recalling a day in 1981 when he says he rescued uh, five Woody <laughs> Woodpecker toys that he saw, the rescued was in quotes, uh, that he saw hanging up as he drove past a petrol station. I screech on the brakes, I do a U-turn, go back and I buy them, and I save their lives, he says seriously. <laughs> I named them Chucko, Buster, Pete, Bob and Dan, and they were my boys, and they were in my office. They were my dear friends for a while, but certain traits started coming out, and they became not so nice. <laughs> Looking straight ahead, he says with a grim finality, they are not in my life anymore. <laughs> I just fucking love David Lynch so much. It is one of my favorite so things much. that has ever happened. Oh. Uh, him re- regaling this story of his five Woody Woodpeckers. It I is. mean, I've, I've, and like recently in the last, my last two weeks, I have had the, I found myself dreaming a lot about Twin Peaks, um, which is weird, but like being like obsessed again to go back through it. Um, so yeah. much so that I've watched maybe like I could have watched the haunting the hill in the time that I've spent watching like videos of people explaining what they think Twin Peaks is about. Specifically that third season. Turns out I missed loads in that third season. <laughs> so much shit. Um and it's it's weird because it seems like the, the internet has anticipated the, obviously algorithms are pointing out what my interests are now, but there's so much weird like David Lynch shit just suddenly appearing in my timeline now. <laughs> like just like out of nowhere. Maybe you'd like to read this. You know, and then the same week I was doing that, that's when that article was posted on the page and I was just like, What the fuck is this? It's like the the like on it and then I read it and I was like, Yeah, it makes total sense. I can imagine I'm doing that. I can a hundred percent imagine I'm doing it. Yeah. It it is both the least surprising and most wonderful thing David Lynch could say. Of course, of course, and it would always be told where the. Stri- I don't think I've ever seen him like telling a funny story. You know what I mean? Like where he's laughing at the end, and then the guy said, <laughs> "You know, nothing like right. that at all." It's always done straight faced, deadpan, and I think that's why he's maybe the funniest guy on the planet. <laughs> yeah, it, right. It's a, a very this uh, humble Midwestern sort of vibe to it all uh it if he is... did a spoken word to it it'd be the greatest thing ever because no two night would be the same oh absolutely not no yeah he, I... yeah he would be capturing the spontaneity of of the moment uh, yeah yeah it, it he's the, the best and and actually in fairness <laughs> when when you sent me uh that message of like i i want to go back through all of <laughs> the twin peaks i was like yes we should yeah which, uh, by the way, listeners, that might happen. It's so not off saying, the table. As n- I don't think it'll ever be off the table. We may at some point just say, you know what, fuck it. We're going back through it all. Strap yourselves in um, and and be prepared for, for, I don't even know how we would do it, but I, I, yeah. I know we would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. I, right. I, I don't know if we would do it the same way or we try a different approach oh, to it knows. even yeah i think it, like we didn't but when we started that we didn't know how we were going to do it yeah. but it ended up <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, i don't know but i i again I'm it might not. happen that's all we're saying it may, that's, it's not a threat but it's kind of a threat it may happen one day so right it's one of those things that eventually maybe like duncan and Bo go back to twin peaksies yeah um, <laughs> the returnsies the return twin peak no, the returnsies no of the returnsies <laughs> Oh no my backsies. god, Twin, Pe- Twin Peaksies No Backsies would be the name of it. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, anyway, alright. Anyway, yeah, so, we're, we're the show we're actually talking about. Um, so, 
uh, after the dinner bell rings and they all assemble again, they're all freaked out naturally. Mm -hmm. Uh, William is like, dinner is in 15 minutes. It's black tie and only the men can join us, I'm afraid. Although the evening is wonderful. I assume you'll be dining on the veranda, Letty. Yeah, outside, away from all the men. Yeah, and so everyone's kind of shaken up. But Uncle George, who, by the way, did not have a terrible time of this, is like, hey, now. (laughs) Buck up. (laughs) We've all seen such horrible things in our rooms, guys. Tee-hee. We need to all all be strong together. (laughs) Tee-hee-hee-hee. I know they were trying to get in your head, goddammit. But you're you're strong. You're Letitia fucking Lewis. Am I right, goddammit? Yep. And which is a nice little moment between them where uh, he's like, and Letitia fucking Lewis isn't afraid, is she? And and he's like, N-, and she says, no, sir. Mm-hmm. It was this nice moment of like respecting her elder or something. Because mm-hmm. normally she's not quite that formal with him, you know? Yeah. yeah. It was really nice. And then, uh, and he tells Tick, who is like, I had to do things in Korea. And he's like, now listen, God damn it. You <laughs> can that shit right now. You are a good boy. You're even better man. And and again, it's kind of a nice moment. He's like, I want you to ever question that, goddammit. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, by the way, I found a book. Yeah, I, I know you were fighting with uh, perhaps a lover. And yeah. uh, and you, on the other hand, were being uh, assaulted uh, sexually by a reptile. But <laughs> I can tell you, I was hunting for a book and it was a real head scratcher. <laughs> it's, it's a goddamn nightmare and, <laughs> uh, but he's like I think I think it could help us out mm-hmm. and they're like oh good I hope I uh, did you take a nap too are you well rested do you feel like you can bear the dinner um, so at the dinner they <laughs> while well, smoking my way through my third pina colada <laughs> I was I started okay. worrying about my cholesterol. Also, I was all filled up on uh, slightly refrigerated peanut butter cups, which are my favorite. And uh, it was just like I like them in a bowl. And every time I took a handful, it would automatically fill itself again with my favorite <laughs> snack. So I, I do feel a little queasy. <laughs> I feel your pain, y'all. <laughs> I, know, I know. I Now, while you had your your hands around the throat of another human being, squeezing the last of the life out of them, watching, watching the life fade from their eyes, God damn it. Uh, while that was happening, I was kind of gently touching your mother's ass. I was, I gave it a little pat because that's what it used to do. Uh, the long story I'll tell you about later, God damn it. But uh, I, it, was, it, was something, it brought back a lot of memories that I'm still working on. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, that's, that's my cross to bear. So, anyway, we open to this great scene of essentially all the robes people, surprisingly, all kind of elderly white men. Who would have thought it? <laughs> yeah, and the the villain from Ghost shows up. And he gives this great speech about like a you know sacrifice and family about how Titus uh, Braithwaite uh, sacrificed uh, himself uh, so that they may stand on his shoulders, and and uh, he says you know in the speaking of sacrifice. Uh, have have this uh, for dinner, and it's this little pea. Everybody gets a little piece of his liver mm-hmm. uh, to eat, and it's kind of funny because it gets put down in front of Tick and Uncle George as well. And Tick immediately is like, "Don't eat that." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. And uh, and then uh, Tony Goldwyn is like, "All right, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, this is gonna be a big night. Thanks all all for coming." And um, then Uncle George stands up and is like, "Well, now wait a second, God damn it." <laughs> Tell me shame. Yeah, I got a monologue to give here, and uh, uh, let me just wander around. And I, I like the fact that he kind of wanders around from table to table, just making everybody uncomfortable with the fact yeah. that there's a black guy at their table. There's also that kind of that that little bit of a uh, when the you know the super detective at the end of the movie has to walk around all the wealthy aristocrats and tell them exactly how it was done. Yeah, um, kind of element about which I really enjoyed. Yes, it is him uh, telling, you know, well, God damn it, uh, I, I don't discover the truth. I, I found the trajectory of truth, <laughs> and I, I just put myself there, 
Uh, so when the truth reveals itself, I, I am there to see it. <laughs> God damn it. Um, and, <laughs> a, mo- a movie I would have w- happily watched. It's see, if, it's see if he had been in Knives Out. All bets would have been off. Ball. <laughs> if it had been Wilford Brimley instead of Christopher Plummer. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, not that Christopher Plummer is a bad actor. He's, He's excellent, wonderful, but, but could you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> Here's what you're going to do, God damn it. You are going to go down those stairs, <laughs> put on this hat, and come back up here and climb down the trellis, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> it would have been, oh, been so good. But all right, so George, though, is just having a field day because he's got the upper hand for once. And he's yeah, playing. He, he knows something that they haven't, that they probably do know, but to be honest, they just probably haven't taken it into account. Or they maybe rest on the fact that they don't know. Right. Because it turns out that there's this bylaw that says that any direct blood relative of Titus Braithwaite is called a son of a son. Mm hmm. And, or anyone who happens to be a direct blood relative is a son of a son. And the only person that can can speak to that, and the reason, like, what Uncle George has surmised is, you know, Atticus is the great-great-great-grandson of Titus Braithwaite, goddammit, and because he's super magic or something, you have to do everything he says, no matter what it is, no matter how crazy, if he tells you to cluck like a chicken and, and jerk off into that dude's face, you gotta do it, goddammit. <laughs> And so <laughs> Uncle George ends with like, uh, so you got to listen to everything you says, Atticus, you got anything you want to tell him? And he's just like, yeah, get the fuck out of here. Everybody but me and the guy from Ghost. Yeah, it does. It does the old day because like, this is uh, kind of reenactment from, <laughs> from Silas. He's like, go on now. Go on now. And everyone's still looking at him. And he's like, come on, go on now. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it takes him a bit of time to realize that the upper hand has, is very much um what are you doing tech. what are you doing the clarice starling of, yeah well, we, we, we've got her from here yeah <laughs> no go on i know your go parents on. would would think thank you if they if they could yeah but because we, got... they don't move straight away when yeah. he says he says get the fuck out of here and they're all still staring he's like i said get the fuck out of here yeah <laughs> just in the back of my head i just said go on now he said bitches fuck off <laughs> yeah and of course the kind of look towards villain from ghost realize that they had been bested bull right um, and they they all get out and off they fuck yeah and and so tony goldwin actually has a really nice moment here where he's like look i'm not a zealot yeah i <laughs> believe in all that horse shit about uh circumstance and and uh tradition in as much as they do yeah and no more and uh, he's like, you you know, my, my daughter, Extina, thinks that you are valuable to us. Mm-hmm. But don't mistake useful for indispensable. Yeah, which I love. Yeah. And and so he, off he fucks. Yes. But and, because he wants to, not because they asked him to. Right. He should, right. It's a, like everybody's laying their dick on the table and he's like, aha, I've got the biggest dick at all. Because if I don't, I, you're here as a essentially the magnifying glass mm-hmm. through which we are going to channel this sunlight to intensify it. Yeah. You are not, if we don't have you, the spell will go on. Yeah. And so while, uh, he says, look, I, you know, the last thing tick says, the last thing I want is I want my father. And it, that's where Tony Goldwyn is like, go fuck yourself. I'm not giving you shit. Mm-hmm. And, but, they George and Tick actually get away to this stone building. They sneak back into the village later that night and find inside Montrose's flask. And Uncle George is like, I know he's here, goddammit. He never goes anywhere without uh, lovely alcohol. And <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> right. And there's the redneck lady, a redneck Karen shows up and is like, Well, I knew you were too stupid. <laughs> Yeah. She's like, well, well, well. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, this redneck lady has a shotgun leveled at uh, our heroes. Mm-hmm. But in comes Letty to save the day, who smashes her in the face with a fucking shovel. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it right. <laughs> right. And then one of my, like, on the second viewing, it became one of my favorite moments in the show. Where they go into this dungeon where they're like, oh, uh, Montrose must have been kept here, but he's gone. And they're like, fucking Count of Monte Cristo, hang on. 
and they find a rock where he has t- been tunneling his way out. Yeah, which is like at like the, the <laughs> he couldn't just wait to be rescued. Right, and <laughs> so they track down this tunnel and are mm-hmm. waiting outside with a car, and he comes out of the ground like fucking raising Arizona, where she's like <laughs> ah. <laughs> comes out and like is looking up at the sky in triumph and stuff and then yeah. looks around and there's george and atticus and he's like the fuck are you guys doing here and they're like well we're here to rescue you god damn it and and atticus is like yeah you wrote me a letter and he's like boy we haven't talked in five years mm-hmm. i would think you would understand that that letter was written under duress and would not get yourself in trouble dummy and <laughs> They're just like, dude, would you just get in the car, you salty old motherfucker? <laughs> he's so salty. He, he's, oh my God, he's wonderful. And um, anyway, they uh, they take a stolen car while George lays down the, the plot that this whole cult like is looking for immortality and they burn down the first lodge trying to get it. That's what burned down the manor the first time was this mm-hmm. spell to obtain immortality. And as they're getting the fuck out of town, they crash into a cabin in the woods barrier. Yeah, which will happen. They do exist. And when they do, you don't want to drive into them. No, your insurance will not cover that. It will not. Okay, force, force majeure. <laughs> so what does this cover? Does this cover, like, um, you know, puncture damage, engine damage? It does. Um why does it say it doesn't cover cabin in the woods barrier? Is that a- <laughs> well, we we cover everything because we've seen everything. But because we have seen everything, there are some things we don't cover. It's a more complicated <laughs> policy that we have now because we don't uh, account for the supernatural. There's just <laughs> we can't do it. <laughs> this is we call this a, a weeding loophole. Um, so we, yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> can't get over that one. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, so it, it's where we don't guard you against uh, uh, invisible barriers or or getting dragged for being maybe an asshole. <laughs> Can't cover either of those things because of the weed and loophole. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, it's not a good deal though. It's a competitive price ball. Yeah, just saying yeah, you I mean, should We're saving you thirteen percent. I don't know. What you want. <laughs> um, but so they they smash into this thing and everybody is fucked up. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Atticus staggers out of the wreck and Letty starts to get out. And then uh, the bad guy from ghost just shoots her in the stomach. Cause he's a bad guy. Right. And, <laughs> and she's like, I can't believe he shot me. Tony Goldwyn. <laughs> <laughs> Say it with me. You're going to be okay. He's, he's such a prick in this scene as well because, like, it, it once again, like, speaks to the futility of their plight. Like, even when they went through all this and even when they think they've finally managed to get the dad now they can make a run for it and they're going to escape, uh, white man still retains the reign of power. Um, and, you know, if he can't stop them with physical barriers and magic, gun will do it. So she goes down and then... Uh, it, it, to add a degree of villain uh, villainousy on top of all this, Bo, he then basically says, listen, <laughs> I can fix her, right? I have it in me to do that. But, you know, if you're going to go, then maybe <laughs> maybe we're just going to get rid of you all. Oh, and by the way, you need to choose who gets the next bullet. Um, and before Tick can even think about it, shoots Wilford Brimley. I mean, Uncle George. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, you know, you want to start making decisions? Here's one you can make. Which one is going to survive? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then shoots Uncle George. It's real fucked up. Uh, I'm not happy about this at all. But no. but while he's doing this, one thing I am thrilled by is uh, we've got a little Marilyn Manson to go along yes. with this. Mm-hmm. We're killing strangers. That's We're a good song. Kid. I dude, I'm I am a sucker for Marilyn Manson showing up in a in a visual sequence. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it works. And yeah. I think that that's how Marilyn Manson writes his music. And that's why some people, it's so boring. I'm like, well, put some visuals on it. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. Boom. Oh, it's so good. And so Atticus is uh, getting cleaned and dressed up in a robe. 
Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm, she's taking too much time examining that dick. Yeah, he's like we get a from the back shot. Um, mm-hmm. The the gentleman uh, Jonathan Majors who plays Atticus Freeman, not afraid of showing that ass, nor should he be. No, no, it's <laughs> tight. Yeah, he should it, like he should have a T-shirt with his ass on it. <laughs> you see this? That's what's back here. You get the feeling that like the office Christmas party, he's the man that's taking the photocopies and you're all getting one. Right. Everyone's voting. They're like, we just want to see his ass. Yeah. Uh, and he, like, that's like, everyone's getting one and everyone knows who it is. Yeah. Well, that's Tex. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he's like, uh, um, hey, I, I see what's happening here. Uh, your father is uh is planning on uh the the plan is they're opening a door to the garden of eden yep and the father is going to step through believing that's going to make him immortal yeah and then i mean that's villainy like logic 101 but <laughs> right i <You And>, mean <laughs> and the thing is this was tried once before and it all went horribly fucking wrong yeah, which is we're going to get a bit of information on this. Basically, the info dump we're going to get here is not only did it go wrong, but maybe, uh, maybe Tex relatives were involved somehow. Maybe, maybe. And uh, also, uh, Xtina is like, look, he's not a bad guy. I mean, like, <laughs> once he's immortal, he'll save Uncle George too, and because he's already apparently saved Letty. Yeah, uh, is, the, is, the, is the thing, which means that he had to pick, right? Which, and, <laughs> we didn't get to see, but that's you know he's thinking everything will work out though, Bo. Right, because he'll he'll be this conduit or whatever, and then also the show is too young to lose or Wilford Brimley. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So I'm glad uh, we pitched our our, our name, <laughs> we pitched that voice to this character so early in the show without <laughs> knowing. Um. <laughs> so Extina then slips this ring on him and is like, um, you know, I could never get this because I'm a woman and you're a man and it's stupid. Yeah. And <laughs> she's like, <laughs> look, <laughs> you just need to find an opportunity and then seize it. You know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and then we cut to Letty who is having a real breakdown cleaning herself up in the bathroom because she is now suddenly totally alive again. Yeah, she was dying and now she's alive. Right, and it like does this thing where she's cleaning off the wound and the blood's washing away and then there's nothing there. But she's not exactly happy. I mean, she's happy about it, but also freak the fuck out. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think is legitimate of like, I I was almost not a person anymore. And anyway, I I think she has a great moment in this bathroom where she's losing it. And then Uncle George is all dying uh, because he's still shot. And he's like, "Um, you two need to break out. And Montrose is like, the fuck are you talking about? We can't get out of here with you shot up like this. (laughs) And Uncle George is like, you remember, you used to draw a lot. And he's like, the fuck are you talking about? I never, I don't draw shit. (laughs) <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you, you used to draw welcome signs and you'd go to the bus station and you'd hold up these welcome signs for the, uh, the, the Negro league players. And it was great. God damn it. And Montrose is like, yeah, I did that until our dad caught us and beat the black off my ass for doing it is the way he puts it. <laughs> and then, uh, uncle George is like, Hey, Hey, before I die, I need to, to tell you there was a lot of love in you when you were a boy god damn it and that boy Atticus needs some love too and I may not be around and you know you know god damn it and <laughs> he's like we're not going to talk about that and he's like I may not have much time left we're talking about whatever I goddamn want <laughs> <laughs> which I like and then we cut away from this revelation that Uncle George is all but like that is totally my kid uh, or could mm. be like I, I, we don't know the full details on this, but it's clear that Dora and George had an affair at some point, and and Atticus may very well be the product of that affair. Hmm. Um. But then Duncan Whitey on the Moon begins playing. Yes, and and that is when this already exquisite show levels up. 
two legend stars. <laughs> right. And Whitey on the Moon, if you've never heard it, and if you haven't watched the show, uh, like I say, it was a thing in the 60s by uh, Gil Scott Heron. And it's this sort of spoken word poetry set to music more than it is a song. Mm -hmm. But the whole idea of it is, I, like, it starts off w with the line, um, a rat bit my little sister last night and Whitey's on the moon. Yeah. And, and again, the idea being that while white America is celebrating this great technological achievement, black America has been left behind and ignored and, and treated like shit yet again. Mm -hmm. uh it, you know that while part of america is excelling there's a a significant portion of america that is floundering and dying mm -hmm. uh and and uh you know a message obviously as the show points out that is still uh legitimate today mm -hmm. and and so there's chanting happening i like the fact that this is like this whole supernatural sequence is set to this where yeah. uh as you're hearing this the cultists are chanting. Atticus starts glowing, uh, and then screaming. Tony Goldwyn is walking around doing, you know, cult leader shit, yeah, and and invocating and whatnot. And then out of this ring comes this kind of black smoke, and as he holds up his hand, uh, in this portal that's opening, he sees this ancestor of his, Hannah. Mm-hmm. And we cut away briefly from this action inside as this spell is clearly working on some degree. Yeah. Like something's happening. And and we, we cut away from that to Letty, who is opening uh, the door. Uh, she's like, holy shit, we're not locked in anymore. Also, the entire fucking house is falling apart around us. Yeah. <laughs> Forcing our heroes to make a run for it. Um we have a great moment where Atticus just screams mm. and energy like flows out of him and then dissipates, but it turns everybody to ash. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, everyone just like, you know, like stones and then ash, like everyone. And uh, yeah, that's what they got. And you're kind of led to believe that may have been what happened when uh, Titus did it as well. Yeah. There's this weird like time overlapping thing where mm -hmm. as T as Atticus is is trying to flee from this collapsing house, he's kind of running just behind Hannah, yeah. who would be his what great 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 grandmother. Mm -hmm. Um, and the notably Duncan, she is holding this book, this book of words that we're going to hear about a lot more in the third episode. Mm -hmm. But she is clearly holding a book, and and she kind of looks back, and it's this weird moment where it's like they they see one another through this portal of time, mm -hmm. and then she's gone, and it's just Atticus kind of spilling out onto the lawn of this place as the whole fucking house just collapses from the inside. <laughs> yeah. <out>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, dear, it's just funny because they all die. Um, yeah, like uh, yeah. Well, not all. No, 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 not all, all, but. So, but we'll get to that. Um, so <laughs> then uh, Atticus hears Letty calling for him and he's like, okay, she's okay. And then um, she just kind of shakes her head. Yeah. And so you know that the, there's some shit going down. And then Atticus goes to the car uh, where montrose is holding george in the back seat mm -hmm. uh just holding his dead brother yeah and and atticus just breaks down there and it's there it's some fantastic acting jonathan majors uh, like we we talk about journey smollett all the time and in the mm -hmm. next episode we're going to talk about her a whole lot more mm -hmm. but in this moment jonathan majors does this you can see this moment in in his performance where he goes from you know what okay i'm gonna be okay i'm gonna be strong and then breaks down again yeah, yeah and yeah. like he he wants to be he wants to be like the 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 tough guy for in this moment for his his now dead uncle who is his father figure you know for all intents yeah, and purposes maybe even his father so yeah yeah i mean may very well be his biological father and certainly is the man who showed him kindness and, and 
instilled in, in him this love of reading and that mm-hmm. kind of thing, uh, even beyond his father. Um, but him like holding his hand and apologizing to him is just heartbreaking. You're just like, mm-hmm. oh man, this is not going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's that's the end of of episode two of Lovecraft Country. But lo- we both talked about this in the upfront. It was just like, well, shit. All right, so we we certainly took care of that. Yeah, well, that's the big bad gone, isn't it? Or is it? Well, you're right. And and what we learn is that there is a larger big bad at work. Like it, it, very tantalizing in the in towards the end of this episode we'll get into it more uh mm-hmm. in terms of the overarching story of Lovecraft Country, but um but, but one of the things it shows though is that there is an anthology quality to this series. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, I think if anything the next episode will show that even more so and that it felt like one like complete self-contained story and oh by the way at the end it links up to where we're going to go next and i think that really really works also like the next episode as well complete change of tone um yeah which doesn't and it doesn't feel jarring week on week which is not easy to do (laughs) that is like not easy to do um and they're ticking off specifically kind of archetype sort of tomes of of styles of horror um in a way which feels you know kind of reverential but not exploitative in a way which was very satisfying as well so like we've we've had our we've had now our our like our episode kind of post giant monsters hunting people sieged in a uh, you know a cabin in the woods come on and mm-hmm. uh, the second movie is the you know the uh, kind of white ancestral family in the mansion house so we've done that um and in the third episode we're just going to go straight up to you bought a haunted house <laughs> you bought amity yo um literally that's where we're going and i i love that diversity of it but the through line all all being about these characters about kind of race politics and um the, the social dynamics that come with that level of inequality and race-based hate um it's handled, it's handled so deftly, um, but at the same time, it's so like out at the front of the show and in not an egregious sort of way that the balance is so like so fine, aligned to keep that how the show has not kind of taken that step over and went one. You know, well, you've put your point a bit too far now. Um, to me, is surprising because uh, they're balancing so much. Um, but episode two was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. And like you, I was kind of like, well, let's see where we go. And then episode three comes along and uh, yeah, <laughs> business is about to pick up. Yeah. Let's get into Holy Ghost here, which is the the third episode where it begins with uh, this raucous kind of funeral ceremony mm-hmm. taking place in church um, while Letty... Uh, while people around her, you know, dance and scream and flail and, and it's a very emotional, but, but like obviously and, and expressively emotional congregation of people, um, celebrating and mourning uncle George. Yeah. And there, this is done over another spoken word bit, which is actually from a Nike commercial. All right. (laughs) Um, but it is, uh, it is written by and about, um, oh, uh, what is her name? Lay is is the short version of her name, uh, and I can't think of her name now. But it mm. is a a trans in, transgender model, um, and talking about uh the the spoken word stuff of like you know when people ask you uh about how how high you flew and and etc cetera, etc cetera. while they are repairing their wings they watch you fly mm-hmm. and it is you know the this sense of of trying to find uh uh, uh both support and purpose mm-hmm. and and that is something that obviously uh we are dealing with in in this episode a lot of this episode is about letty trying to make sense of her life following the events of the first two episodes and um as we see her kind of stoic in this church 
we then cut to credits and there's an insert following that, Mm -hmm. uh, which is about three people uh, going missing in an all white neighborhood in 1955. And then at the bottom, it says pioneering can be dangerous. Yeah. Um, and pioneering is actually a, a real thing is what it was called when uh, uh, a black family or, or black residents would move into an all white neighborhood. Uh, yeah. So, and, and we'll, it, it will, it will get worse. I assure you. So Letty uh, is dragging her sister Ruby down the street uh, of uh, a white neighborhood where she mm-hmm. announces that she has bought a house. Yeah, the camera pans around, and it looks like the <laughs> all that's missing is the thunder lightning in the background. <laughs> right, like because it like it panned around to that. I was like, that house is haunted, you. <laughs> like, that's right. a murder house if ever I saw one. There's just a clown with balloons outside. Ah, come inside, <laughs> kiss me, fat boy, <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, and the whole time. Ruby, her, her sister, is like, where did you get the money for this? And Letty yeah. is very, very uh, deftly dodging that question. Yeah, she keeps, like, every time she gets out, she'll wait to see this room and wait to see this room. And she basically, she wants to do what her mom had, which was start a boarding house. And, you know, she's going to have, she's going to use this as a, a, like, a well, a boarding house, for those that don't know. It's a place where, you know, in the case of what she's going to use it for, where, um... Uh, people of black race can, you know, if they have very little money, find a place to live uh, for a time period until they can get a job or whatever, or get enough money to move out somewhere else. Uh, and so she's doing the good deed here. She just so happens to be bringing it to a white neighborhood, which, as you can imagine, Bo, in this time period, probably isn't going to sit well. Um, right. And I, I love this because she's walking around and this is it's going to look so much better. And she's trying to talk Ruby into staying. And Ruby eventually acquiesces uh, by saying, listen, well, I get the big room. I get the biggest room here. And she's like, oh, great, wait to see this. So this feature, wait to see it. This house has an elevator. So she's like, no, it doesn't. She's like, yep, and she opens the door and there ain't no elevator there, Bo. No. Well, not yeah. at first. No, because she, <laughs> she sticks her head into the elevator shaft and she's looking around. Still can't see an elevator, Bo. And then as she's, you know, leaning down into the elevator... The, uh, the, what the car rushes up this time, I think, I think it's down yeah. the next time, but, uh, it rushes up this time and almost kills her. Yeah. Almost takes her head clean off. Right. And, uh, as the audience, you're like, oh! and she's laughing about it. Ruby doesn't look too impressed. Right. And as an audience, you're like, that elevator is totally going to murder somebody in this yeah, episode. That- I, I'm no, I'm no, um, I'm no paranormal investigator, Bo, but that is the possessed elevator <laughs> like, right elevators don't move like that <laughs> so uh, so yeah so we we establish okay we're doing this boarding house that that uh letty has bought under mysterious circumstances ruby is going to move in and they're kind of making a go of it mm-hmm. and then we cut over to hippolyta doing her makeup while uh at downstairs atticus and d are making breakfast in you know george and hippolyta's house yeah, she's doing her makeup while tearing pages out of her husband's favorite book, Dracula. <laughs> Just yeah. tearing them out. Oh, man. Yeah, she is not pleased with her husband suddenly being dead and probably is doing some blaming of him. Yeah, and guess what? The the, the young man that went away with him to protect him is just staying in their house. And he has kind of assumed the male role of the house. You know, he's, he's making breakfast, he's getting everything set up. And, uh, of course, she comes down and you can feel there's tension in there. <laughs> like, yeah. Just a little bit. Of course, it, what's sad is Dee's set out, you know, a place for her, her dad and it suddenly twigs on her and oh, he's not here anymore. Uh, so she's getting that ready to clean up. And there's just, like, I, I see it's really well done, actually. There's just a series of kind of awkward junctures where both Tick and Hippolyta kind of, Oh, no, you go, right. Because you get the feeling that if you live with someone long, like, see my, myself and my wife going to the kitchen in the morning, we know what the rhythm of that room is. I know when she's going for her tea, I know where to be, I know to take the milk, I instinctively will take milk out the fridge. Uh, you know, like, you know, it's left for her to make her tea while I'm making my coffee. Like, you just get into that rhythm. 
if someone's not used to that rhythm ball, you imagine you're just tripping over each other. Oh, excuse me, awkward. And that's kind of how it is. Like she goes round uh, to get herself a coffee. He's all no, he's going to get it. And then there's a lovely little detail which is explained later on that, it's like these small things where she's he's put a cup. He's obviously washed the cup and he's put it like up. Um. Or is it down? I can't remember now. Did no, it's up. He leaves them up because yeah, he's he a monster. Yeah, well, he, well, he, well, I mean, they'll never dry that way. <laughs> I mean, they'll dry in the outside, but there will be a small pool of water in the bottom. That's yeah. not how you dry a cup. Not right. that I want to tell how to dry a cup, but that is not how you dry a cup. Right. And she's like, she just turns it over and all the rest. And to Tick's credit, um, he's maybe sensing some animosity, but it specifically comes out when there's a conversation about the publisher looking for the next print of this kind of the, the book that they do which is a version of the green book um and you know hippolyte is like oh yeah i still need to do that and he's like i've taken care of it i sent it away i thought you'd wanted to go out in time and she's like but i didn't proofread it and he's like well i checked over and it'll be all right and you can just see at that point she's like oh <laughs> uh yeah you have to go uh, you have to go um and to text credit he reads the room like i would read the room and that maybe I've overstayed my welcome. And of course, Tick doesn't have that many places to go. So he's going to go with, uh, go and see um, his dad played by the Wires Omar. Uh, because, I mean, after going through the experience he went there, Bo, surely his dad is now clean, sober, after, you know, after seeing the magic and shit. I mean, that'll sober you right up. And maybe it's bonded them over the loss of his brother and his uncle. You know what I mean? That's a bonding experience. So things are going to be fine now. Almost entirely not, Duncan. <laughs> you couldn't have been more wrong, Duncan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when he shows up at Montrose's place, uh, Montrose is passed out uh, from the night before, one presumes. Mm-hmm. Um, bottle of whatever booze he was enjoying still open in front of him. And he's talking in his sleep, and and Atticus uh, just throws some water on him because that's how everyone likes to be awakened. Yeah, and, it does it by reciting the end of the story that he is talking about in his dream. Right, the "I got you, kid." And mm-hmm. here's <laughs> this show. Oh, nice move, Lovecraft Country. Yep. <laughs> we learn yeah. here that this "I got you, kid" story isn't about Jackie Robinson. It's that the way that Uncle George told the story. Mm-hmm. was that when they were they were both uh he and Montrose Uncle George and Montrose were in this riot there was the they were about to get brained by some cop or something and uh, uh another guy got the the cop like hit him with a, a a baseball bat and the way that Uncle George always described it was like like Jackie Robinson mm-hmm. he hit this guy with a baseball bat and said I got you kid and which once again opening sequence of the first episode right and i'm wondering that made me wonder like i wonder if there's a lot of shit that we're gonna look back on and be like oh there was so much more in that first i think so yeah i, I think so i think it was so densely packed with information that i think more stuff's gonna spill out but i i, I, I kind of like this idea of him saying you know uh, uncle george used to tell me that story over and over again um and he basically asks um, his dad Montrose, if he can stay with him, and his dad kind of, oh, yeah, I'm like, whatever. But there's a, a stark contrast in how breakfast is served between the houses. Because if you remember, <laughs> like in the in the in Hippolyta's house, um, it was all bubbly music that was getting played. They were all kind of dancing together while they were setting out breakfast and all the rest. His dad puts what my subtitles said where it was somber classical music, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is exactly what Montrose is playing. He sits down with a, a glass of OG um, at an empty table in a dimly lit house. And, I mean, like, the, the conversation is tense, to say the least, because Tick doesn't want to be living this lie to Hippolyta. He's like, she, like, I've overstayed my welcome. I think she thinks that I'm lying to her. Um I mean, maybe we should tell her what happens. And like, and Montrose is having none of this pitch. She doesn't want to know, tell her about magic and all the rest. And the conversation like leads up to a breaking point where, and once again, like the the actor whose name escapes me that plays Montrose, aka you know Omar from HBO's The Wire, Michael um, K. Williams. 
he's a very slight, small guy. But I'll tell you right now, I about shat my pants when he slammed his hand off that table. I was like, this is a man you do not fuck with. Um, and you get the feeling that, I mean, Tick's a big guy now, that if they probably scrapped, Tick could probably win. I think he knows that. I think he knows yes. that. But he also knows that this is the time to walk away from this conversation. It's not going to get anywhere. He's never going to get his dad's approval to have this conversation with Hippolyta. So he packs up his stuff, and guess what? Looks like he's not staying near either. Yeah, and a couple of things I really like about this scene. Mm -hmm. I like when uh, they're arguing about... Uh, whether or not to tell Hippolyta the truth when he's like you want me to tell them that there's fucking wizards in the world <laughs> that w that white folks have magic too yeah yeah as if that you know as if they don't have all the privilege and power as it stands just now but you want me to tell them that they also they control magic and shit yeah that's a uh, conversation that's going to go down really well right like why why on earth would you ever tell someone that if they didn't need to know that yeah. That the deck is that stacked against them. You know, yeah. like, oh, by the way, in addition to all the systemic stuff, there's also magic. Yeah, magic. Uh, and they're really good at it. <laughs> like, it's right. Still, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that moment quite a lot. Uh, but then we get a title card uh, in the episode, Duncan, because we're Amityville horroring this, as you said, mm -hmm. where it just says, day two. Um, yeah. And then Letty is taking some pictures while uh, some folks from the South side have, are helping her move in. And it's a really nice, like tracking shot following her around the house. And there's a another one tracking shot. Like, once again, like, if, like the, the visual style, the, the, the sound design, amazing. The choice of soundtrack, amazing actors, brilliant. But the, uh, the, the visual style of the show, which changes up episode on episode, uh, I don't know if that's because they have different directors per episode or what, what's happening, but the choice for the tracking shot in here feels very authentic to the version of this story they're telling. Yes. You know, you're, you're getting acclimated to the house as the camera moves, so we're following our characters and we're getting, oh, right, this is where the hall is, this is where the dining room is. Like, we're following her through in one nice big tracking shot. I think you once described um, on a, a recording that we did that um, Poltergeist has one of the best you know, kind of introductions to the family. It's all done through a tracking shot with a dog. Yes. <laughs> you, you get, you know exactly what the house is. You know everyone in the house. Boom, 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 done. And it's the same here. We're traveling through. We're getting a, a, a full feel for it. And we're also, we're also very quickly going to get an indication that reason maybe the white people aren't arguing as quick as they are is that Letty's pulled what they call in the, in the business a fast one, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> she's been she's been quite clever in the way she's done this. She has she's thought this out. Well, so Atticus shows up and she's like, Hey, you haven't been around for three weeks, you dick. Yeah, that's pretty much the cliff notes of that conversation. Yeah, and he's like, Well, I'm about to hit the road, and she's like, Oh, uh, are you are you going back to Florida? And he's like, Yeah, I, you know, I told my boss I was gonna be gone for a few days, and that was a month ago. And she's like, you know. I can let you have a room here mm -hmm. uh, if you want to hang out for the housewarming party because it's going to be a banger. And this is where, it, to your point, he reveals, he's like, hey, this is pretty smart, by the way, moving in on a Sunday morning when yeah. all these white people are at church. At uh, church, yeah, so you're not going to get any you know, mobs or any, any kickback. And I, I like Letty's like, kind of this wry smile. It's like, Yo, you got it. <laughs> like. You know what I mean? Like you understand, and I, I kind of like it. Also, great addition to her. Her cat, she sold like she. I was said before, MVP of the show because she's she's smart, articulate, and just a total badass. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, which we will see. Like she is the best way I've heard her referred to. I think is a firecracker. Oh, and yes. I, th I think that is a hundred percent right. She is just the firecracker of the show. But mm -hmm. anyway, so um, as, as they're talking about her great plan. It turns out that there are some horns, horns honking outside, mm. and the racist neighbors have shown up, and they come yeah. out onto the porch to see these, you know, the white asshole neighbors laying down on their horns. One guy's got a brick tied to the horn, so it just he can just sit beside the car as it blares, mm -hmm. and Ruby comes out alongside Atticus and Letty, and she says oh, this is going to be Trumbull Park all over again. Mm -hmm. Which leads to our history minute on oh. Duncan and Bogo to Lovecraft Country. Trumbull Park 
uh, was an all white public housing, uh, uh, you know, block in the Mm fifties, like 53, 54. I I, want to say is when this happened. And what happened was a woman was placed in this public housing area who was black just happened to be very light skinned. And so when the, you know, because it's public housing, she was placed in this community on the basis of needing assistance with public housing, but it was a segregated community, whether it was segregated on paper or not, it was segregated. And Mm -hmm. so when her very much blacker husband showed up, the community went fucking nuts and they tried all kinds of things. They tried, uh, short of moving the family out. Mm -hmm. Uh, they tried to increase the number of black families, uh, that were in this public housing community. And for literally like two decades, there would have to be police protection for those families to have their kids play in the park. Jesus. Right. So when she says this is going to be Trumbull Park all over again, it was incessant uh, uh, abuse and incessant uh, torture of, of families until they finally just gave up and moved away. Mm-hmm. And so that is your history minute about how, even though uh, oh, the racism that you see in these shows seems uh, almost cartoonishly evil at times, eh, it turns out most of it happened. So, you know, <laughs> that's fun. Um, but then we see some crop, uh, some cops cruise by and here is something that was different. Like in, in the Trumbull park scenario, the cops were not saints or anything, but they mm-hmm. did ultimately provide protection for the families. Yeah. Um, I mean, it shouldn't have been necessary and the cops probably weren't great about it, but they did. Um, so, but we see some cops cruise by here and they just see all this honking and, and whatnot. And they're like, yeah, they're literally, they're doing the cotton equivalent of whistling and putting the fingers in their ears. Yeah. They just, they cruise by and say nothing. Uh, and then it's day five. Mm-hmm. And so Letty is in bed and, uh, we see a ghost do the, the sheet yanking trick. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it's yanking off her feet and whatnot, the old paranormal activity we call it in 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 my neck of the woods. <laughs> and then we see a ghost beside her bed, which looks like this this kind of, eh, you know, older black lady. Mm-hmm. And Letty uh, doesn't see her, uh, but then we see more of the ghost, and she's missing the bottom half of her face. And yeah, <laughs> the visual effect, by the way, is fucking incredible. Well, by the way, the visual effects just across this, apart from one scene, are incredible. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think there's one scene I'm not crazy about, but mm-hmm. um, at any rate, so uh, yeah, so then all of a sudden the sheets get yanked completely off of her, and the, but the ghost is gone, and Letty is awake now, and the radiator, uh, and I think this is the ghost, what we learn is that these ghosts are kind of helping Letty. Mm-hmm. And I think this was the ghost waking her up because of what was going on with the boiler. Yes, it's exactly what it was. But and at first viewing, maybe we take it another way, which I kind of like that. Yes. Once again, that's a trope that's been used loads in haunted house movies. Um, but I didn't pick up on it straight away until about halfway through it. And then I was like, aha! Aha! <laughs> Eureka! <laughs> uh, <laughs> you think you're so smart, Lovecraft Country. You ain't so smart. You ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like the the radiator um busts and she makes a, a beeline i believe is what they say uh downstairs to the boiler well she's gonna open the window but as soon as she cracks it the horns get louder yeah and like, she goes uh, oh you motherfuckers yeah <laughs> and closes the window <laughs> it's a great moment where she's like god damn it i'm just hot and i gotta deal with your your racist bullshit and be hot mm-hmm. at the same time and of course, so she runs downstairs and she will have to like maintain a boiler, which once again, trope in some haunted house movies. Wink, wink, no such. Um, but yeah, so she has to go way down there and, and, and take care of that. But yeah, like you say, meanwhile, we don't know how many, well, we know they've been, it's overnight in the house now, but those horns have been going all night, Bo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, which I know at some point I'm starting to think that upsets the black people for sure, but doesn't that upset the white people as well? <laughs> You, you would think, yeah. 
but maybe like they're a self-inflicted gun wound. <laughs> Surely, don't make me shit my foot. But I will shit my foot. <laughs> but also, I think it's a thing where like the racism feels so good. Yeah, yeah. That you're like, look, this is a real pain in the ass, but I know how much the the black folk are are hating this, and that yeah. makes me feel good that because I'm a broken good, person. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I'm a broken person. <laughs> because Twitter hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> I don't have 140 characters, but I have a horn. Right. Um, yeah. Um. So, anyway, so she fixes, it turns out, like, somebody's ripped the, the handle off the boiler, and so she has to get a wrench, and... Man, again, I'm a broken person as well, uh, but there is something about seeing Journey Smollett with a wrench turning a boiler that I'm like, that is one of the hottest things I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was just getting it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like what, what she can do plumbing too. Just, yeah, of course. Of I want, course, the I, dream woman. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I can't do plumbing. I don't know about you, but I'm like, and I, why, like electrical wiring, yeah. I'm I'm your guy. Like any other manual DIY anything, I can't do any of that. So I I'm surprisingly better with plumbing. Well, maybe not surprisingly. My dad was a plumber, so I picked up some of that. I'm not, <laughs> not, it's in the blood. <laughs> so, actually, Duncan, I've been a plumber for 17 years. That's why I'm less afraid of it. Uh, I'm still afraid of it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Just yeah, less but so. But I, I love like it, the the great thing about Leia as a character is regardless what the situation throws at her, she rolls her shirt sleeves up and just does it she does she does what she thinks is required and necessary to resolve it and i there's no um you know like, she just gets on with it um right. it's just a trait that i think makes her fucking badass yeah yeah and there's a striking example of that in a moment but uh, but first she gets a little spook because after taking care of the boiler she starts to hear some more banging and then discovers a la the haunting of hill house which you haven't seen yet that there is a <laughs> a trap door in the cellar and there's some creepy shit happening with it. Mm -hmm. And then she goes to get Atticus and she's like, Hey, I saw, uh, like I heard voices coming out of this hole. And he's like, look, I ain't the one to tell you that. I don't believe you after the yeah. shit we saw your house being haunted is one of the least surprising things that could be happening right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and remember the garden of Eden. <laughs> But, and he's also like, but we also haven't really dealt with this and it could be stress and, but whatever it is, like, I'll help you deal with this. Yeah. And then she takes his hand and Atticus, like a fucking fool, pulls his hand away and Letty just gives a look away from him like, motherfucker, like I'm giving you every signal. That I'm I possess. You the keys to the kingdom, though. Yeah. The kingdom and, of Letty. And Atticus no. is just like, this sure would make a good room for a dark room, lady. <laughs> and she's like, Are, look, do you want to fuck or not? And he's like, do you want access to my dark room? Come on, let's do this. <laughs> right. Well, if we're standing in it, I guess I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> we're like, God damn it, Atticus. <laughs> Read the room. <laughs> yeah. You, you were doing so well. Like, you picked up on all the subtle cues you, that... Hippolyta was laying down and you did the right thing there. And we're like, you know what? I'm overstepping some bounds before this gets like before anybody's feelings get hurt or before anyone gets angry. I'm going to say thank you for having me and I'm leaving. Oh no, this one too. You were polite and courteous. <laughs> <laughs> then you come in here with your clumsy comments about dark rooms. It just one too, one too. <laughs> Atticus, check out you store it. Uh anyway. Um <laughs> So then we go to day eight after Atticus's genuine failing. Yeah, like fa failure as a man. Right. It's <laughs> one of those things of, like God damn it, kid. You could you you know what you could do? The old <laughs> Duncan and Bo standby. You yep. could be fucking. You could, you, well, if you could be, but I think, well, he should be. He should be fucking, as we have Stress often said. Levels? But he, Stress levels being as they are. Not only should he have been, which is a constant rule, he could yeah. have been. He could have been. It was, it, was, it was not just even, like, intimated in the conversation. It was there. She, there was a hand grab. That was, yes. in it. That was an initiation hand grab. This is the, the, the formal introduction to the world of Letty's 
lady areas and you you retracted your hand like a fool and yeah. then you made a, a banal comment about decor in a room yeah yeah she drew first sexual blood yes with the hand grab mm. all you've got to do is nothing yeah just <laughs> let it happen let letty dictate the terms dictate being the right word right all you got to do is stand there the gradual kiss is going to happen and the next thing you know you should be fucking yeah <laughs> anyway so we go to day eight yeah after the collective sound of me and Bo slapping the top of her head going oh no <laughs> right what are you doing man um <laughs> rock music is now being played at the house like it's you know the fucking Gaddafi's uh castle <laughs> And it's yeah, like you can't hear the horns now. Right, that loud. love it. So it's the night of the house party, and Letty. It's another tracking shot because the this show is just showing off. Yeah. Where it's Letty roaming around with the pitcher, and now instead of people filling the the house with and carrying furniture and stuff, it's a bunch of people having parties uh, or, or having uh, a good time at the party. Letty's got a pitcher of whatever concoction they've made that's probably mostly paint thinner. And mm-hmm. is is pouring <laughs> glasses for everybody, and there's a great conversation that happens as she's passing through a room about Martin Luther King Jr. changing his name from Michael to Martin mm-hmm. and getting a black wife, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, which is all true. And it's one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, and and Letty has a great line where she's like, well, just because he likes a uh, a white lady doesn't mean he can't help our people, I guess, and mm-hmm. then just kind of laughs. And then she uh, cruises through, like, the living room where Ruby is singing. And Ruby, who, by the way, uh, played by Wunmi Musaku, Mosaku, mm-hmm. uh, N- Nigerian actress originally, um, is fucking great in this episode. She's got a real showcase of a scene coming up. But, yeah. but I really like it when she sings, too, because she's a really good singer. And she, mm-hmm. she looks like... Like the uh, this sounds terrible, but she looks the part of like that forties, uh, like I'm on the stage grinning as I sing kind of character of like we're having a neighborhood party mm-hmm. and nobody's gonna see the party outside of this, but we are going to have a fucking blast. Yeah, yeah, and she's brilliant. She's really like specifically in the scene we're coming up to. She's like, was like, I, 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 great casting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I feel like we point these things in, but we just have to we just have to assume from now on that any casting choices made by Lovecraft Country are going to be exceptional. So, and that's yeah, it. <laughs> no, it, it's a real something. Uh, so, as Letty winds around the house, uh, and it is a banger of a party, one that I would have no place in. Um, yeah, I, not, yeah, not, be not well. because of a racial thing, just because I don't know have a, how to have a good time like this. Like, no, I'm, no, I'm the same. I'm, I'm like a let's let's stand in the kitchen and chat. Speaking <laughs> of, like I yes, I am the <laughs> the Hippolyta of this party where I'm the same. <laughs> where you go to the uh, the kitchen and there's Hippolyta like arranging the food and that yeah, kind of thing. That's me and yeah. and she's also like like uh, Liddy is like thanks for all this food and she's like yeah it's leftover funeral food don't worry about it it's not cursed or nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> not so sure about that. <laughs> but. I- but they continue chatting and she's like that, you know, about um, a tech like come across, oh, comes across and you know looks after D and you know does it that and leaves his cup drying up. <laughs> like, yeah, like, that, this is still burning a hole in her ass. Sure, it is that cup pointed up, motherfucker. You stay out of my house. You keep your hands off the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's nonsense, Duncan. What are you trying to do? Just grow fruit flies? <laughs> That's where she goes to the conversation. Yeah. And it's just like, she's like, oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I'm like, clearly it's something I had fucking eight days ago and you're still on about it. Right. It, well, and, and Letty is asking her, like, is it weird because he's like trying to assume George's place? Mm. And there's some of that, I think. But I also think it's just like, hey, you know, I don't need you to be that person. Yeah, I also think, like, as we find out later on, Hippolyte is, she's she's a smart woman, and she's picking up there's something in the body language or, you know, the way he doesn't make eye contact when she's speaking about Uncle George's death, 
but she knows she can smell some straight up bullshit here. Yeah. There's something not being told to her, and as a result, that's making like their existence together one that's kind of built on a lie now because there's something in there. There's a bit of information that needs to come out for them both to relax around each other, and it's not there. So. Yeah. All right. So we'll come back to Hippolyte in just a second, because first mm-hmm. we cut down the basement where the kids are playing with a Ouija board in the basement of the Sonnet House, which is... Which, I mean, never a great idea, but I love it when it appears in the show. Yep. This was one of the few scenes that with a Ouija board where my eyes didn't roll back and come back again. <laughs> like, most of the time when a Ouija board appears in anything horror-related, they go, oh, here we go, and the eyes roll back. And they'll stay back there for the full time of that scene and then come forward, but it's, it's done in a... It's done in a really cruel sort of way. Um, but once again, through knowing how this show ends, uh, this episode ends, actually maybe not so cruel after all. Right. It's just perceived that way at this point. So <laughs> so it's they're, they get around to, they're asking some silly questions and getting some answers. And then they ask who, who it is that they're talking to. And it spells out the name George. Mm-hmm. And D Not rightfully, guys. yeah, D yeah. just flips the board. Is like fuck you, assholes. And I mean, I'm not far off. She, I think she mm-hmm. does call them assholes, um, and which it, totally accurate. And then uh, we cut up stairs to Hippolyta, who is kind of hearing something from the attic, maybe. Mm-hmm. But then a door opens on a room beside her, and there's this weird, like, gold model of the universe or something. Yeah, as you just find in a house. Right, and she goes to it, but there's a, a like there's a moment where she seems to recognize what this is, or at mm. least be amazed by it or something. Like there's some Well, she's got a telescope in her house, remember. Well, this is true, but I, I'm wondering, like, well then what what is all this about? I think we're gonna find out. I think we will. <laughs> so Atticus We see you, Lovecraft Country. We know what you're doing, planting seeds. Yep. So Atticus arrives at this party in uniform Mm. while one of my favorite songs from like this era, like a great jazz song uh, called is you is or is you ain't my baby. Yep. Love it. It's a great tune. And as that's playing of Atticus goes to a doorway where he can look in and there's uh, Letty dancing with a dude. Yeah. And this guy, sexy dancing. He's kind of sexy dancing, and this guy, I think it's the same dude he ran into at the bar in the first I episode. Think, I think you're right, yeah, yeah. Uh, who's just like, say, hey, baby, uh, <laughs> hey, you doing anything with that girl? Because if not, I'm going to holler at her. And he's like, you know, we fooled around when we were in school, and I'm feeling a little nostalgic tonight. And Atticus is like, the fuck did you just say? And he's like, oh, it's cool, baby. But if that is yours, then you need to let somebody know. And Letty is giving him this look like, uh huh, you know what mm-hmm. you could have, but baby, if you're gonna j- talk about dark rooms, then this dude's <laughs> gonna get some action. And Letty then goes to the bathroom, and for a second we see a ghost in a mirror behind her, because again, the, like every now and again, the, the the show will just remind you, like, hey, by the way, ghosts. Yeah, <laughs> but. <laughs> Which I, which is ironic because the villain of that movie died in the previous episode. I, that is interesting. You yeah. should put that on IMDb. I'm going to do that. Conspiracy. Uh, IMDb fact. Uh-huh. <laughs> One of the trivia. <laughs> and Tony Goldwyn was in the movie Ghost in the third episode of Lovecraft Country. There were ghosts. <laughs> yeah, it's like literally going to have like no likes and 145,000 thumbs down. Right. Just, thumbs down fact. How, yeah, how is this... You, th- like this is one of those Billy Madison. I'm now dumber for having her that conversations where I not only have I not learned anything, I've somehow decreased my knowledge of film. Yeah. <laughs> but so Duncan, look, clearly the makers of Lovecraft country listen to us, uh, from the past. Of course. Well, the, I, <laughs> yeah. you see, using time machine technology, <laughs> They built a portal to the Garden of Eden that made them immortals, and then they built a time machine in the future, having listened to this episode, to go back to the past to give Eddard notes. Right. This this uses Bill and Ted time travel logic. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, that new one, totally fine. 
I have done. not seen is not out here yet. We'll eventually see. Kind of looking forward to it. Don't expect much, and if it delivers not much, and I'll be happy. It, I, I would argue it delivers more than not much. It is, it is a perfectly fine another Bill and Ted movie. That's fine with me. Then, yeah, that, that I was totally. Uh, that's how I felt about it. There is, there, there is a character in it that rivals Death from Bogus Journey in terms of being like surprisingly funny. Nice, uh, nice. So anyway, um, but. In this bathroom scene, Letty, after she sees the ghost, she turns around and it's like, oh, is she going to see a ghost? Nope. It's Attica standing there. And then he shuts the door and these two gorgeous creatures finally fuck for us. Dance Mm -hmm. puppets. Um, Yep. And it is glorious. Yep. It's it's hot. It's heavy. It's in the bathroom. And there's a lot of, like, a lot of attention instantly leaves the room. But then returns <laughs> very, very quickly. Right. You get a kind of post coil, like literally three seconds of, ah, and then we are given a scene of Lady finding that she's bleeding. Um, but like the the comment she makes is, she, uh, "Sorry, I didn't realize you know it was my time of the month. My monthly like, started, yeah, yeah." And he's like, "Oh, I'm really, really sorry." And she's like, "Don't be." And then it's a awkward. And she's like, "I'll see you downstairs." And he's like, "Well, you know." Okay then, maybe, and she's like, okay, and then when we see Leia again, she's sitting downstairs, kind of like uh, emotionally stunted, um, and things are like at peak levels of awkwardness, and then, Bo, we hear a bit of a ruckus, um, and the camera pans around, and guess what's on the garden? Guess what's in that garden? Oh, there, the, there's the a cross burning on the lawn, Duncan. A giant and a white man running away. Yeah. And Ruby immediately is like, where are the kids? We need to get the guns out of this house. And (laughs) because the cops are coming. But (laughs) Letty at this point, who has just finished crying after Atticus bailed on her after weirdly reacting strangely to having blood on his dick. Yeah. uh, Because that's one of those things. I don't know. It's just never bothered me. I'm like, I don't care if you're on your period or not. If you know, mm-hmm. sometimes you fuck on a period. Sometimes it happens, mm-hmm. uh, and it ain't a thing. And especially, especially if he's fucking Letty. Yeah. <laughs> like just uh, you know, as you described, a complete badass of a character. He should be like, I don't uh, look. You want me to go down on you while you're on the monthlies? We'll do whatever. I'll eat your ass. I'll eat every, every goddamn thing. Uh, in the words of. Uh, Gary Oldman from uh, True Romance. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But Letty is now, she's just kind of had it. Because, you know, there's uh, the cross burning. There's all the honking. There's the unsatisfying ending to the fuck that they just had. And she grabs a baseball bat. And as Mm -hmm. music, like gospel style music starts playing... She just starts busting in fucking windshields. Oh, she she goes out there, a, a one woman wrecking crew, oh. and just like dismantles something. Like that, it's this small attention to detail. Like, so not only does she start smashing in some windows, but like maybe the next car, that you know, that wind the windshield that's coming right off, uh-huh. and you know, all, the, all that that you know, a headlight that's getting smashed in. And she works around um, making sure she takes every brick off every <laughs> single fucking horn. Yeah. Like, like one at a time. And the camera really relishes it. And I relish the camera really relishing it. Um, uh-huh. And yeah, she, she once she's done all that, though, she understands that, you know, they now are going to have a bit of an issue with the police. And what I love about this is straight away, like, all the guns flung in the back of a car that car drives off like, really, really <laughs> quick uh they all assume the position and are all arrested by the police um although i don't know if they are actually all arrested by the police or specifically if it's lady that's arrested by the police because she's the one that did all the swinging the guys didn't do anything else and there ain't no guns to put them which is probably why she's sitting in the back of the paddy wagon as it's driving along the road right so. uh, yeah i think i think it's just her but yeah one you know again because this is just a we love letty uh podcast one of the moments in this scene is it perfectly encapsulates what I love about this character. Mm-hmm. It is after she has busted up one of the cars and she is walking to the next and she takes a moment to straighten the strap of her dress 
and then just clubs another window in. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like that, like, by God, I'm going to look good fucking this car up. Yeah. <laughs> and it is everything about the character that I adore. It is this, this strength, this pride that mm-hmm. is just undeniable about her. And even in this paddy wagon, man, when she's alone with this cop and he's like talking about her rap sheet that she's been involved in all these social movements and stuff like that. And just, you know, call him like just the worst shit in the world being racist about, it, of course. And uh, then he's like, so did someone ask you to buy the Winthrop house? Mm-hmm. And she gives him some attitude about this. Which maybe isn't the best way. <laughs> no, because he has a leather strap, and I didn't know what he had that leather strap for at first, and then all of a sudden it became very clear. <laughs> right, but but again, it's just it, it's who she is. She, she just yeah. does not take any shit, even mm-hmm. from a white cop in the back of a paddy wagon. Mm-hmm. And the, <laughs> as a result of that, um, the driver just whips the the paddy wagon back and forth real hard sending letty who is handcuffed yeah uh and without any way to steady herself just into the side of this old school metal can yeah he death proofs her <laughs> yeah he does <laughs> it's literally the death proof scene and she gets fucking ragdolled about the place <laughs> and of course the cop's leaning into this more and more and then we get a little juicy detail bowl which i was like that goddamn murder house that's what i said <laughs> Yeah, well, he says there uh, there were eight black people found dead in the basement. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to Letty all fucked up in her would-be dark room, like, uh, without makeup, you know, like, cut over her eye. You know, she looks like she has been bounced around a paddy wagon. Mm-hmm. And in a very J-horror move... She finds all these pictures in this new dark room of hers uh, that they form a face. Yeah, this is the maybe that like we were talking about earlier on. This is maybe the one effect that I wasn't too keen about, unless they were paying homage to the haunting we make from nineteen ninety nine. Uh, in which case, they nailed it. <laughs> you know, on the on the second viewing, I, I yeah, I felt the same way. I don't think it's a great effect. I think it's certainly the weakest of the episode, yeah. and, and, and an episode that is mostly great. Yeah, it, yeah, it is across the, the board. Yeah, it is the one thing that stands out of being like, eh, I don't know about that. But it does deliver the old Amityville line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get out of my house. It's a cut out. <laughs> I was like, oh fuck. <laughs> um, and <laughs> like, like she she's upstairs taking pictures out. People are leaving because they don't want to be there. And of course, we have this great altercation that we pretty much set up earlier on between Ruth and Letty, where she's like, listen, all these people are leaving, and Letty's obviously like just seen a fucking ghost, so she's like, yeah, they shouldn't be here, they need to get out. Uh, and uh, Ruby's like, well, not, we'll not be able to make that installment pay- payment if all, we don't have the rent coming in from these people staying here. And Letty maybe gives us an indication of where the money for this place has come from, where she accidentally, or maybe intentionally, because I, I feel like there's, there's part of Letty that likes to sabotage things as well, especially in relationships. Because um, you don't drop this detail without thinking about what the consequences are, even in a moment of panic, uh, where she's like, that, you know, we'll be fine. I've still got some of mum's money anyway. And Ruby's like, what do you mean mum's money? And it's like a kind of, oh shit, I've said too much. And we basically get a bit of detail here that the mother left a sum of money in her mm-hmm. will that she was contacted about um, to not the brother, not the, you know, not the, not Ruby, the older sister, but left it all to Letty. And Letty didn't tell anyone about it while still borrowing money off her brother and sister. Um, And it's kept a secret as well, which, I mean, if I'm Ruby, that's a fucking shitty move to do. It's a really shitty move to do, especially when you're all moving in together and you've been asked three times where that money's come from. You could then say, listen, I got this inheritance money. This is this is our future. This is our, we're going to make something of it. Do our mother proud or whatever. You do it then. You don't like use basically what the, you know, like kind of the, the premise that she's, which I think was in the best of intentions to get her sister to, to come in with her. But once again, under this, 
Our sister already has trust issues with her, and this has not done anything to alleviate it. But if you're me and you, Bo, we're like that. This seems a bit suspect, because Ruby's like that. Mum didn't have any money. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like, she had nothing. Like, it's like, no, 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 it turns out she did, and she left it all on me, and it was enough to buy this house. And we're like, uh, <laughs> really? And I'm thinking shenanigans, Bo. Yeah, I mean, it's one that I would call shenanigans on as well. More so if it didn't implicate Letty quite so much. Like, I'm more inclined to believe it because it, it does make her look so bad. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and, and Ruby has some great hits here where she's like, you know, I sent you money all the time thinking that you, it, it, she says, I thought you were a fuck up, yeah. but you're just fucked up. Yeah. And it's. It's a heavy hitter, man. Man, <laughs> Ruby. Things. That's a, that's what you call a good put down. Yeah, because Ruby's like the thing to do would have been to like uh, what's her Maurice is their brother. Yeah, uh, she was like, why didn't you immediately just let us know when, when we split the money three ways if you really wanted us to feel like we were included in that? Mm-hmm. And anyway, she has no. Letty has no answers, and Ruby fucking leaves. Yep, she's having none of it. She fucks off. And now Letty is about to go, well, can we say it like full? <laughs> she's doing what? We, she has no microfiche. There is no library here. But she does have some paper, a notepad, and a pencil. And she's going to get to that. But uh, we're going to have an altercation between Hippolyta and uh, our buddy Montrose. Um where like Montrose bumps into Hippolyta. She's taking stuff. Drinking on the sidewalk, it. Duncan. He's, well, let's be yeah, fair. I, he, He's out doing what Montrose does. She's <laughs> right. partaking in a bit of fresh air and maybe a small snifter of alcohol if it was available. A little nip um, of the dog, yeah. Yeah, and uh, of course, Hippolyte is carrying these brown paper bags full of her shopping. And um, he's like, no, no, let me help you. And he comes in, of course, to spill some stuff. And they're sitting there. And of course, one of the things that falls out of the bag that Montrose dropped is, an, is a copy of Dracula. And we have this, oh, this is, you know, George's favourite book. She says, yeah, I spilt some coffee. And she's looking at the camera going, the audience knows that's a lie. I spilt some <laughs> coffee on this book. And he's like, all right. And then there's an awkward silence. And then Hippolyte just comes out with it. Uh, which I kind of, once again, love the characters in here. Like, there's a degree of bullshit they're not prepared to take or tolerate. And she says, well, listen, how is it whenever I speak to tick about you know, I saw the you know what the gunshot was and I don't want to know what you did to those sheriff and his men I don't want to know it and you did what you had to do and that's fine but how come every time I look at him I feel like he's hiding something from me yeah you know, like he's not telling me the truth and um I'm just gonna say Montrose does not play this scene off well plays it off KG <laughs> like would I lie <laughs> he's like he's rolling in his head <laughs> it's it, like... yeah it's just like what did I tell you oh uh, well then that yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, we know that this is going to come back. Like, there's got, there's going to be a reckoning somewhere down the line here where she's going to get get told and shit's going to go south. Yeah. Um, the the other shoe that hasn't dropped again uh, that will at some point, I think, is the fact that D seems to know where shit is. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I I never thought of that. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a real family affair at some yeah. point, but. Uh, so then, Duncan, let's go to day 10, the, the final day of our haunting. Mm-hmm. Um, so Letty has been had her sheets pulled off. She's been told to to get out of, of some dude's house. Uh, she has had spooky guys in mirrors. Um, <laughs> but but it all comes down to this mm-hmm. where uh, we find her first at a bar where, like you said, she's kind of doing research. Yeah, I love this, this scene as well because she's she's like she's just writing words frantically writing words and Tech comes in and sees her and he's like, What are you doing? She's like, My house is haunted. <laughs> like, I, yeah, I like that. And I also like the fact that his response to that yeah, this, I, mean, I love this. Yeah, is like, all right, walk me through it. Yeah, walk me through it and sits down and it's no no judgment, no like because he's done that before already, and we've been through some shit, and she's still saying that. And she starts to talk him through everything. And I'm like that. Oh, why won't you just be a, a, a couple? <laughs> yeah. Why you... can't you be George and Hippolyta? Yeah. Uh, what are don't Sam and Diane me on this? Yeah. 
<laughs> I need oh, I need you two together. Um, <laughs> Making my way through the world today. It's <laughs> like, like, just come on. Um, and of course, we get the revelation that, and I love this scene as well, which is like, you know, but you know, when we did it, it was like, you know, my first time. And, <laughs> and he's like wearing the glasses, like first time what? And she's like, no, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's like. Oh, <laughs> oh shit! And then the gravity of the situation, and then he tries to go around and console her, and they're still kind of slightly standoffish. And I'm like, just get together, you'd be adorable. Well, imagine what your babies would look like. Le- le- <laughs> they'd be Sorry. beautiful, yeah, <laughs> oh. beautiful, beautiful human beings. But mm. um, she has a great moment here, though. And then, again, I my my love of Liddy's character just knows no bounds. But mm-hmm. uh, where she's like, look. Part of what happened with us is me trying to figure out what shit means anymore in a yeah. world where I thought there weren't monsters and then there are. She was like, you know, I'm, I'm terrified of that, but I don't want to be afraid. So I need to stand up and stake my claim in this world instead of instead of hide from it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, fucking yeah, Lenny, just... Like, I, I want her to be, like, some powerful psychic warrior or some shit. Yeah. <laughs> and and so then we uh, we cut to Letty Atticus and this psychic lady, or, like, a, a, a sort of a juju lady that they... they... Oh, I, I love it, because, like, if your white neighbors aren't already appalled by the fact you brought a lot of black people in, and you played music, and you came outside and smashed up cars, a black woman bringing a goat up and slitting its throat on the porch... Yeah, I mean, sacrifices like about a thing. <laughs> right, right on the porch, and and gives like is like oh, this will give you uh, protection, and rubs blood on the foreheads of, of yeah. Letty and and an X on both of the t- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then on the front door, and <laughs> right, and and we know from the opening shot of this scene that a dude is just staring at this happen, mm-hmm. and it's like, I don't, like what I, the I, fuck. Like, I is like, where did you find this one? <laughs> right. Did you dig up this relic? <laughs> and, and yeah, and Letty says uh, her mother was a huckster, but at least she did her research. I Meaning, like, apparently she did some research about the, this kind of uh, this kind of hoodoo, yeah, uh, stuff. And um, anyway, so the the hoodoo lady is like making a circle uh, with their hands and yep. calling out to Mama Oya. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a uh, an African goddess mm-hmm. of purgatory, Duncan. Oh, mm-hmm. I like it, boy. I like and, it, boy. And also of like wind and storm, kind of like uh, you know storm from the X Men kind of thing. Yes, which also seems to like it, it seems to inform what happens in this scene. But mm-hmm. um, so while they're doing their ritual down in the uh, dark room slash murder basement, yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. some some white guy neighbors have snuck in and are up to yeah white racist be doing white racist things right sneaking in getting up to no good hijinks and yeah. as two of them go off in one direction they this is where they're confronted by the ghost that you mentioned oh, this earlier is fucking like this is the, one of these moments where you think you've seen everything in cinema <laughs> yeah or in tv and then you see something that actually makes you go that's fucked up <laughs> like, okay. like caught me by surprise because the, the this kind of frankenstein creation of a kind of giant basketball players and full basketball gear but with the head of a baby yeah and these kind of big hands and mm-hmm. like the all the ghosts have like weird proportions to some degree yes. yeah and it it's really <laughs> Again, you know, I I watched these episodes a couple of times to do notes and also just to kind of drink them in. And watching it the second time, this starting from this moment in the show, it is a fucking funhouse ride to the end. It is so good. Uh, But yeah, the 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 ghost is super creepy and forces them back into this radiator that bakes them alive or whatever and <laughs> yeah also you like because we, we did scut over the scene because we were talking about the fuck dynamic um of it it's revealed uh uh you know this white guy scientist quote-unquote scientist had bought the house and he was conducting human experimentation on um well let's be honest black people uh and that was the bodies that were found in the house 
probably the spirits that we've seen. This is why they've got the Creole lady in. And you're assuming the human experiments might be Frankenstein type experiments? Maybe so. Maybe? I mean, and, and it's also revealed in that that this, uh, this scientist who lived in the house and was, you know, using black people from the South side as, as test subjects, mm. um, knew the guy from ghost. Yes. So that there's a connection there as well, uh, with the sons of Adam or whatever. And also my connection to using the ghost reference, uh, earlier on from IMDb. So suck it. Can yeah. Come up. That's right. Uh, <laughs> um, if you look at the IMDb trivia, uh, you, you have to scroll down some, but you're going to find that. On, yeah, the uh, thumbs are just uh, as we talk, Bo. The thumbs are switching from down to up, down to up. Right, it's like a minor miracle. Everyone comes around to it. You know, like you know what? That was a good bit of trivia <laughs> across the world. As people realize, <laughs> have second thoughts about <laughs> the guy from Ghost in Lovecraft Country. It's the end of Independence Day. It's like let's send out the good word to people on Morse code and their friends just now telling them to change the thumbs right. the thumbs up. God gave rock and roll to ya. <laughs> Oh uh, my god, the Americans have sold it by you. <laughs> yeah. When this was, is how we talk in 1996. Tally ho. <laughs> when will the Americans give us a solution? <laughs> Fucking hate that movie. Oh, I, mean, I, so I, I love it because it is so s- stupid. It is, <laughs> like, it is a truly dumb movie, but in a way that, that does my heart good. Anyway, <laughs> we're not here to talk about that. Um, so, uh, as... The baby head ghost murders those guys. Yeah, the, another guy is going. You know what? I'm just going to check what's up with this elevator. Man, he leans over into it and it whisks down in a way <laughs> that just knocks him back, and the camera really lingers. Yeah, on the decapitated body. Yeah, and just it's, squirting it's, blood out. It's a real, and it's a it's a fucking great effect. It's like, it's. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, but I was genuinely surprised at how long the camera lingers on this blood just squirting out of a stump neck. Mm-hmm. Uh, not even neck, like there's part of the jaw left, which is real good. Um, yep. Yeah, it's a squishy one. <laughs> is it, you know what? Lovecraft Country gives you a little gore too. Like, how could you, how could you not love this show? Mm-hmm. Um, and then Duncan, it's like, okay, okay, we've had our fun now. Uh, now it's time for the vegetables. Only the vegetables are roasted and seasoned, right? And they're delicious mm-hmm. too. Um, <laughs> where, uh, a water pipe then breaks. Uh, yeah, this and, ghost is clever. <laughs> right. Scientist, remember? Scientist. <laughs> um, just like Coldplay said. And yeah. <laughs> then the water pipe, <laughs> science and love craft. Um, but water uh, washes off their their symbols on their foreheads, so they are no longer protected from this evil spirit. Yeah, and then the psychic gets slammed around a little bit, and then when she gets yep. up, she's all possessed by the the evil ghost. She's got black eyes now, so she's she's possessed. That's the indicator that she's possessed, and she she throws Letty about the place, then grabs Tech, and then you know starts you know messing with tech you know what i mean <laughs> like <laughs> i've got about 10 different jokes running through my head and they can't order themselves in a way and get them out in a funny way so it's just like a, a hodgepodge <laughs> so you're, you're sticking with messing with tick i can't i can't i can't honestly i've got like <laughs> messing you know with I mean? tick is the name of a james taylor song when he wanted to get fun <laughs> just messing with tick but like essentially she kind of drops down um onto the ground and the the spirit realizing that you know what if i'm gonna fuck this place up i need a stronger body i need tick goes in a tick and then he starts doing the uh, kind of the leosteen walk man uh, it's a really good it, it's kind of the uh house on haunted hill remake effect it totally is but yeah. but there's a little more of like a body coming out of him Yes, it it's really cool. I like I like this performance of being possessed a lot. Uh, yep. of being like you're kind of fighting it, but you can't kind of thing. And yeah, but all the gnarled like ghosts start appearing. Well, and, she like, calls them by name. Letty starts calling yep. them by name. Yeah, uh, because she's worked out um, that they've been there to help her all the way through this, 
And then they create the circle that we saw earlier on and continue the chant, the banishing chant. Um, and old ticks, you know, she's getting like, and the, the things try to come out on. Um, and as they are doing that, the body of the demon is slow or ghost is slowly starting to disintegrate. And the body parts that have been mutilated off the, the people that he murdered uh, are starting to build back on. And it's really, really, really cool, actually. I really like it. It, well, um, and it's Letty and all the ghosts, like, chanting in Creole. Yeah. Of course, she has a great moment, like which, like, gave me wood. Where, yeah, because, like, she's chanting, and just at the moment where it's like, you know, the ghost is on his knee, she yells, Get the fuck out of my house! <laughs> and, it again, in a lesser film or show it would be like well of course she says that yeah but here it's just like there's such raw emotion because as you point out like these ghosts becoming whole again yeah. is really emotional and kind of wonderful and even seeing the you know that monster baby-headed ghost just become a, a dude yeah and yeah. and all this stuff and even the ghost realizes that they're becoming Whole, and it's this speech that Letty makes, too, about how they're still powerful, that they're still alive, that they can mm -hmm. still fight against this, that they can take vengeance on the man who murdered them. And it, it's a really wow of a scene. Like, it's one of those things of, like, fuck, all right, Lovecraft Country, like, you did that as well as I think it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great. Like, uh, again, Journey Smollett is, she just delivers emotion in a way that looks so raw that I'm like, man, I hope I hope she was okay after this. Yeah. <laughs> she seems like really just like both energized and spent in equal measure. And yeah, performances like that take a toll. You know I mean? Yeah, it's a real something, man. And then we have our kind of wrap up moment, uh a little epilogue on yeah, this episode. Yeah, she's been episode. interviewed by a black reporter for the fact that she's done this incredible thing, setting up this boarding house for, for people that can't afford their own place and what she's done to the community and what what the idea was behind it and, and all the rest. And I, what I love about this is, like, if you're me, you're like, well, did they just bury the three white guys? So how, how did that get resolved? Because we didn't see that. And the reporter says at the very end, and I love this, she's like, off the record. <laughs> you ain't writing this in my article. Um, you have any comments about the, the, the missing three white neighbours? And like, Leslie, like, this is literally the first time hearing about it. And I'm like that, oh, well played, Letty. You're just like playing this off as if nothing's happened. Well done. She gets her photo taken. And then as they're walking away from the elevator bow, it starts to go down further than the basement mm -hmm. mm. and then it also reminded me that in the title credits for Lovecraft uh, Country you get that house and there's lots of roots coming out from that house quite deep into the ground and we go down 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 and then we stop and we see some dead white folks well and, and that's not all we see <laughs> no it, it, like there's a whole tunnel under yeah. there with some old skeletons in there Lots of old skeletons as each bulb lights along this very dark tunnel that stretches off ad infinitum into the into the distance. And yeah, that's uh, episode number three. Oh, no, like, whoa, whoa. not oh. yet, Duncan. There's one miss? more scene. What did I miss, Bo? Atticus uh, happens to be in town when he sees Extina. Yes, how did I forget this? This is basically the setup. <laughs> yeah, going into an office, mm -hmm. uh, like a realty office, and Atticus follows her in, and then like lets the realtor leave or whatever. Yeah, and then they're he, packing up. They're packing up that shop. Yeah, <laughs> they ain't coming back, Bo. <laughs> so as soon as they leave, and it's just Atticus and Extina, he like flips the bolt on the door and closes the blinds, mm -hmm. and she's like. Oh, it, I guess it's good to see you or whatever. <laughs> it's so hot. <laughs> and um, then he's like, so uh, I, I I noticed that that name Winthrop was on a uh, the it was it was inscribed on one of the frames of a painting at the Braithwaite estate. Mm -hmm. And Extina is like, oh yeah, Winthrop was like totally into the Sons of Adam, but then. <laughs> 
he was like, hey, we should translate some stuff. And my dad was like, you should shut up. And they had a, a big fight. And so Winthrop took some pages and ran off. What are you doing here anyway? And Atticus is like, I just don't want you to ever fuck with anyone I know again. And pulls a gun and tries to shoot her. He's got a gun. Um, and rightfully so. Of like, And he doesn't hesitate. It's no. a... I am about to shoot this bitch right in the face and then walk out of here and whatever happens, happens. Um, Except he can't. Right. She's got some spell that she explains where she's like, most wizards only know like one spell maybe. And my dad knew invincibility and he thought that might make him immortal, but that was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm invincible and you can't shoot me. And then as she's saying this, she's like uh, turning the blinds again. Yeah. So that uh, the light is spilling back into the room. And she's like, so anyway, this Renth Winthrop guy has a bunch of pages from the book of words that we need. And so we're going to find them and then we can translate them. And there's going to be all kinds of spells. Mm. And at, at the end of it, she kind of leaves Atticus frozen in place there. And she says, um, by the way, you should be more careful. You can't go around killing white women like that. And then leaves. Yep. And so the show kind of ends on that note of, like you said, we're setting up this idea that, oh, there is this other super valuable piece of this book that we last saw the book itself with Hannah. Yeah. Which now, now I know what we're doing. Right. And there, so she's got the book of words winthrop has a piece of the pages up from the book of words mm -hmm. you know wherever those may be and so the son the sons of adam if they continue to be a thing or if it's just extina and her crew could be trying to find this book or well these pages because what she doesn't know that i think atticus probably does is that hannah had that book at the end yeah, you've seen it. So, yeah. Ooh. So we're getting into a bunch of, like, ancient book shit. And, in fact, in the second episode, they name drop the Necronomicon. Mm -hmm. And and they're like, no, 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 that's not the book we're talking about here. That That's the names of the, the dead. Yeah. These are the names in the Book of Life. And, anyway, so we're we're definitely dealing in sacred tomes territory which is very lovecraftian of course uh duncan also exciting <laughs> yeah that's what i was gonna ask so now that we've reached the end of the third episode what did you think about uh the the episode three holy ghost i thought it was fucking brilliant and once again like if we're taking this that each episode may be uh premised on a kind of anthology basis where we're just going to tackle a different sort of horror thing um, but have a link through maybe you know bookend in each episode which links it to the overall mystery i'm cool with that and if anything that's that's leaning towards the old uh, x files you know monster of the week sort of setup and uh you know we have we have an idea of what the the, the kind of master plan is but that doesn't mean that we can't just mix things up throughout the episodes and give you different things so far they've covered three different kind of horror templates and done them exceptionally well um, and the more we get into it, the more we're starting to see nods and connections to things, not only in our world, Bo, uh, and historical um, relevance, but at the same time linked right back to things we're seeing in the show that people are saying or stuff that's in the background. So it's a very rich show uh, to watch. I thought uh, there, was, there was segments in this that were, that were absolutely brilliant, and their kind of take on the you know Amityville sort of thing worked incredibly well. Um, the acting super yeah everything about it like this one maybe didn't have the same flair as the previous two with being more kind of insular and almost one location based for its entirety but it delivered it in a way which i thought you know and let's put it this way lovecraft country is the most exciting show on the tv right now um by by a country mile <laughs> yeah um so I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything else that I'm hearing the same sort of accolades be put against. And yeah, bring on episode number four. Um, so I can't wait to see where we go. Yeah, I, and this was one I did not watch the coming next time on Lovecraft Country because I was like, I'm you same. know what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in your hands, Lovecraft Country. You have proven to me you don't have to tell a story about a remote estate um, and, and Shoggoths. You can do Shoggoth. a haunted house story. 
<laughs> I am lamb. Um, <laughs> we need to do it, dude. We need to do it. Yeah, it's again, we can't talk about it on the air, but we will. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> look for that in, in store soon. Uh, but I, yeah, I think I think the show once again, you know, we talk about how this show just kind of moves with a swagger that it makes a lot of brave decisions and doesn't ever seem to question itself. Mm-hmm. And so, it because it never apologizes for the decisions it makes, it never it never uh, moves by half measures. Yeah, you know, with the the Jefferson theme or using a Nike commercial to open a church sequence, mm-hmm. whatever it it fits and it worked and it made the show better, and so that's what they do. It and, has the kind of cat to box mentality. If it fits, it sits. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, which I'm one hundred percent down with. Yes, do yeah, it, it's just it, it feels uh, like one of the most like creative and interesting shows. And even if it ever wavers to being didactic or whatever, uh, which I don't think it really has, but I I think it, even if it does for a moment, I'm willing to excuse that because it still gets down with the scares. Like the ghost stuff is legit good. Yeah, yeah, agreed, hundred uh, percent. So yeah, I I with you. I can't wait for more, uh, Duncan. Between yes. now and then, we'll be back in a couple of weeks to talk about that, but. Uh, between now and then, what are you looking forward to watching before uh, we get out of here? And uh, and while you're at it, go ahead and pimp your shit. Um, I will be... I'm watching a TV show called The Stranger. I just started it today, so I will have finished that. And then next on my list, I'm bumping up The Haunting of Hell House. So when we record in two weeks' time to do episodes four and five, I will have watched that. So that is a 100% Duncan guarantee, definite. Um, I'm so yeah. excited for that. I can't. I can't I wait can't to talk wait. to you about be, yeah. because I genuinely want to talk to you about some of the characters and 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 get your uh, get your read on them. Yeah, um, I, I mean it's going to happen. And yeah, I've I've been told episode six I think is the one that will make me shit my pants, and I'm 100 percent happy with that. That's fucking um, good. No, that like there is a middle sequence. Like the first episode is is very much a oh okay this is what this is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, then th- it builds to like that sixth or seventh episode where it's just like, wh- how in the fuck are they going to end this thing? And then you get to the end. It's like, oh, okay, well that's how they're going to end it. And, yeah. and it's not as enthusiastic because the highs are so dizzying in mm-hmm. the middle of that s- series where it's just like, how in the fuck can you top this? And it's like, well, you can't, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is as good as it gets, but uh, it's still really good and satisfying. It's uh, you know, it's it's good. Mike Flanagan and Mike Flanagan, I think, as Doctor Sleep, the director's cut has shown us. Um, mm-hmm. the the more space you give him to tell a story, it turns out he just makes the story better. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. That'll be that'll be ticked off the list for sure. No doubt between now and then, Shudder will have dropped another couple of movies that will be picked off as well. Um, but you can check out my thoughts, my musings on the various things that I'm checking out on podcasts under the stairs. Everything to do with that show can be found on the website, which is tputzcast.com. Well done. Professionally uh, handled. Um, I'm going to watch Impedigore. You've got me excited. I may watch that uh, not long after we... We in this yeah, discussion. drop me a line once you've watched. I'd be interested just to your your initial cliff kind of cliff note review um, no. of that once you've done it. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, I, I will certainly let you know. Um, and uh, and and as for me, obviously, legionpodcasts.com is where you can find uh, pretty much everything I do. Um, Pick six movies uh, is one that I always mention that is now in its thirteenth season, where we are talking about the uh, the movies of uh the the james bond series Mm. and doing uh one with each actor that's a good move yeah well uh it turns out we can only do this season once though because (laughs) of one of the james bonds was only in one fucking movie well Uh, yeah um yeah uh, (laughs) i guess we could slip in like david niven or something for (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I like George Lazenby as a, a James Bond either, if I'm honest. I don't like anybody as a James Bond as it happens. <laughs> That's the wrong approach. I, Sean Connery's a fucking national treasure, and you will shut your whole mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I hope a little sexual assault is it, isn't oh, too yeah, out of line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't do it in every movie. Dude, uh, we watched Goldfinger. Right, that's a bad one to go with. <laughs> right, when, when he's in the barn with Pushy Galore. Uh, yes. When he's in the barn with her and 
is just like, how about I just sit on top of you until you like it? <laughs> how about you like, how about you do that pushy? Um, it's like that movie is uncomfortable. Gross. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Most of the Bond movies are uncomfortable. Yeah, uh, in that in that in that realm. Um, and yeah, yeah. and I and it's the best Bond though, and I'll not hear a word against that. I don't. Uh, no, I don't think that's wrong. I I think he is the best, the best actor to kind of encapsulate that role. Mm. And I I think what I've learned is I just don't like that character. No, no, oh no, oh, no, but then mm, yeah written in a time period and by a man who's mm. <laughs> right yeah no ian, uh. ian fleming also seems like a real asshole we get into that on the first episode um but uh yeah so if you want to listen to more about bond stuff uh check it out over there uh goldfinger is uh not out yet uh, goldfinger will drop friday and then nice. uh and then of course uh following that because there is only the one where we'll be doing uh, her, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, yeah, the, and I've never seen it. So, oh, you've not. Right? I, there, oh. it turns out I haven't seen a lot of Bond movies, and I think that I mean, that's one of the reasons I don't care for them is I come to them late, and I'm just like, this is boring. Yeah, they're they're, they're shown on UK TV all the fucking time. Like, like, see, whenever there's like Easter holidays or Christmas holidays, they put on a lot of Bond movies. Um, so I've grown up with them since I was like knee high to a grasshopper <laughs> like yeah like genuinely have seen them all many 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 times over um so you you just become used to them uh but there's a right. whole lot of bad ones in there and as un- unpopular as it's going to be on this recording because uh, i know there are some people that listen to it that are born fans not a big fan of uh, roger moore he's, he's maybe got some of the better bond movies but i don't like him as bond uh i'm up I, I will always Always root for Timothy Dalton. I think some of the Timothy Dalton ones in the 80s are fucking legit good. Um, and he always looks like he's, like, every every Dalton appearance, he's either just been fired from the Secret Service or is about to tender his resignation. <laughs> um, like, every single one of them, uh, he's uh, the, every single representation he's in there, he's like the cop who's about to get, you know, give me your badge, Gabrowski. <laughs> you can have my badge, Chief. You know, is, is, is every single one of them, but for whatever reason... He, he brings an intensity and a bit of youth, uh, which is really, really good. I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to, to rolling through your season and uh, and hearing you shit on movies that basically built the backbone of British cinema. Sure. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so. there's plenty of that. <laughs> oh, show Goldfinger. You don't... Uh, uh, one of my favorite you things... Me to, you expect me to... No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. My, my, uh, here's my a- absolute favorite thing about Goldfinger, is that before James Bond fucks anybody in that movie, he's like, show, do you fuck Goldfinger? <laughs> I'm not going to be Eskimo Brothers with that fat son of a bitch, I'll tell you that much <laughs> right now. But like he does it with the girl who's helping Goldfinger with the cards at the beginning, and he does mm-hmm. it again with Pussy Galore. Where both women, he's like, is that all you do for Goldfinger? Because I'm yeah. telling you, if he's put his Goldfinger up in that snatch... There's no play for James. <laughs> not taking, not, t- not taking the sloppy seconds of that German bastard. <laughs> you can get the, you can get the, the Bond, but not the James. Yeah, um, yeah, As, yeah. There's a the, yeah. That a that shit of, makes me British laugh. cinema in the sixties and seventies, bo, is literally brimming to overflowing with sexual innuendo and tension, but a stiff upper lip that will not give you it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's uncomfortable. But my biggest, uh, like the, the, the takeaway from watching all those bond movies is reaffirming my love of the Avengers TV series, okay. which is like, this is the, the version of this. I want to see that's kind of innately goofy, yeah. but also a little weird and kinky sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So. But it's the same when you watch things like the scene, as well, yeah. the, same, the TV show from that time period. It's, it's, it, that, I mean, because they're, they're on TV, there's less of that, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but they did they pushed that a bit more in the movies. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah. Well, that's enough. We'll do, we'll talk about James Bond on another show, but um, <laughs> probably not. I feel like we've we've exhausted <laughs> we've it. We've done it. We've literally talked about them all. There. <laughs> that's right. So um, next time on on Bond Talk, it's Pierce Brosnan. Yay or nay? <laughs> Cheers or jeers? <laughs> Hot or not? Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to Pierce Brosnan. Cheers He's to Timothy thumbs Dalton. Thumbs down. <laughs> yeah. He can take that ice castle and shove it right up his. Anyway. <laughs>
Um, Duncan, thank you so much. Uh, the folks, thanks for listening. Uh, as always, like and rate and review and all that fun stuff. Nothing left to say, but good night, Duncan. So say good night. Good night, Duncan. Yes. Yes. You're not fooling me a second time, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Filed at last. At last. I don't know.